You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. I know. And today's guest, we've got Maureen Tongi. How are we? Well, very well. Very pleased to be here. Very pleased to have you on. First of all, we'll promote your book straight away, The Visual Detox. Very interesting, especially with all the stuff that people are consuming. There's billions of uploads every day online. And um, I think we see, is it 10,000, it says in the yeah, book? Yeah, you're consuming 10,000 images. images every day. Mm -hmm. And this is to tell you how to detox. Where can people buy your book first and foremost? Literally everywhere. So it's been published with Penguin. You can find it at WH Smith, Waterstone, Dance, Online, Amazon. But it's really the idea that everything that you see is shaping you and shaping your brain. Like everything that we say, actually, you remember 20% of it, but everything that you see, you remember 60% of it. And all those images are shaping the way you have desires or insecurities or you want to buy certain products. Like it's, it's the understanding that those visuals are shaping you. We're getting programmed. Well, you're getting influenced visually, but you don't tend to ever think of visuals. You tend to only think of words that are really shaping you. So it's, it's kind of, how do you train your eyes to kind of understand that this is really shaping you. How do you also train your eyes, especially with the rise of visual misinformation, to challenge what you're looking at? Is it real? Is it fake? Is it, um, you know, is it pushing you to do an action that you don't want to do? Is it triggering you emotionally? So it's really like tuning into a world that has become overtly visual, but we do not spend time analyzing. Yeah. Before we get into all this, though, and I always like to go back to the start with my guests, get yeah. more a bit of an understanding about you, where yeah. you grew up and how it all began. So I grew up in France, which is why we're going to be challenged by our accents today, aren't we? Yeah. It's a Scottish and the French accent. Um, my two parents are primary teachers. My mum is still actually teaching as we speak. She's got a class to six or seven years old right now, 30 kids at 65, which I have a huge amount of respect for. Um, and then I grew up off the west coast of France. It's called La Rochelle. You probably won't know, but it's two hours from Bordeaux. We were five of us same age at school, really remote. Um, yeah, I mean, there's more rabbits or birds than there are people, but it's absolutely beautiful. Um, and I was incredibly close to my grandparents, very close to my granny. And um, she actually passed away and was buried the day of the book being published. Um, and yeah, it's it's actually really interesting. She was 101 and she got to see my two kids as well, which is extraordinary when you think about it. But the book is dedicated to her. And one of the things that I love the most is that it's dedicated to her in the present because she was alive when I wrote it. And even though now she's passed, it will forever be written in the present, which I love. But yes, yeah, she passed away and she was buried on that date. And it just, it felt like a turning point, actually. I'm still going through the flux of acknowledging what happened. And she is very much the parent for me more than my parents. So it's, it's grieving someone that has given you all the confidence in the world, has made you feel that you could do anything that you wanted. Um, so it's that person that just passed. But therefore, the immense luck to have been growing up with that person. How were you at school? Um, that is a, I've never been asked that question. I knew I would be walking in today and you'd be asking me questions I've never thought of. How was I at school? I was overtly keen. I'm still overtly keen, which meant that I would do the exercise so much more. Like, you know, if you asked me to write something, I would then build something around it, plus write it, plus think as around it. But I was crap at following the exact, um, exercise. Um, I would go above and beyond, but I would not answer exactly um, to the exercise that you had asked, which meant that sometimes I had teachers who absolutely loved me. And they, at 10 years old, I got my writings published by one of the teachers, but some of the times our teachers will completely disliked me. I think to this day, I think it's a bit the Marmite effect where I feel I am used to have either the praise or either like someone that will completely reject me. And I think through school, I've been lucky to have teachers who you know, my literature professor would take me to tea and would just be there for me. And then others who literally sat me down, my history professor told me that I would do absolutely nothing in life and I was a total piece of shit, you know? So it's always quite extreme, I think. Uh, but that goes with, I think, a, a, prof a profile of someone that is probably tacky, you know, not able to do exactly 
what the exercise is and exactly what anybody else is doing. Um, and I was not doing it out of malice. I just, I can't brain-wise exactly implement the exercise. How do you handle rejection? Um, I think better. I mean, I'll probably ask you uh, that question. I think the beauty of aging is that you handle it better. Um, and... I think rejection is part of my job. Like on a day-to-day -day basis, I built um, the first global talent agency in the art world. I get rejected every day. Um, you know, we're trying to pitch for the top talents. We're trying to pitch for the top projects. There's not a day that goes by, which I'm sure is the same for you, where you don't get rejected. So you kind of, you, you kind of have to accept it. Um, there are rejections that are uh, probably harder to take because those things matter to you emotionally more than most. Um, and I'm sure in my early days, I probably didn't deal very well with it. I think at this stage, it's part of life. Um, so, But I have all the sort of coping mechanism to deal with it. I might go for a walk, I might go dancing, I might go and play tennis, I might go with my kids, I might talk to my, to my best friend. But, but I will, I hope, not act on it, not be tough yeah. to the other person. We talk about no everything's visual with 10,000 images a day people can yeah. see. I think there's nearly 6 billion people who are online now. What do you think of the system in school? Because back then, it's everything molds you. Even yeah. from schooling to be getting taught from nine to three by a teacher, you're not really you're not really molding your kids. In my own opinion, kids are more influenced by their teacher or their friends. So the system as well, does that mold you with the things that you're reading up on, like world wars and economics and... A lot of irrelevant shit. I, I think we need to understand the basics of communication, um, reading, writing. Yeah, um, that's a very good question. So my total example of I think with the top country, um, the top country when it comes to education is Finland, where they have visual analysis, media analysis, they question history, why history was written the way it was. So they're basically, the whole system, and it's state school, it's not just, it's not private school, the whole system is built to make you question uh, the society you're in and, and comprehend and develop your own opinions. That is definitely the one I connect the most with. France is a very dogmatic system, which means that ultimately, you have to memorize things over and over again and you have to implement what you're told to do. So, you, and that's the part I struggled with because I feel I, I never connected with levels of that person knows, so you should not question why that person knows. I, I needed, I had so many questions. I still have so many questions. And the system that I was um, brought up in was not built for questioning. So I feel, I would hope, especially as we see the rise of AI, that educational system will be built now more towards question than memorizing, because that is the skill set. Like critically thinking, questioning things around this, that is really the thing that can save us. Having a diversity of thinking, having an understanding that ultimately not everything is true that we're being pushed in. That's the part that I would like us to be more taught. As we speak, um, it's not taught across the globe. Finland is one of the few countries that does it. You're more likely to have it in private school in the UK that you have in state schools, which is really unfortunate because, you know, we talked about 10,000 images, but four out of five billboards in the UK are in working class areas. So actually kids in working class backgrounds are the ones that are getting the highest density of images and much more targeted. So they will be the one that will be even more in need of being trained, of challenging what they're seeing. So there's a deep lack of it. I hope we can be part of the people that finance and support that change. Um, but yeah, there's a lot to do. Yeah. Scriptures and books and textbooks, they all change through years. Germany would have been taught a different thing about Hitler, Gaddafi, our prime ministers here, wars. Yeah. Different countries learn different things. Yeah. And that's why you've got to question it because in school, it's all about your memorization, which is the left side part of the brain. Yeah. To memorize, memorize. You get an A or a whatever it is to be top of the class because you can memorize better. Doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be the best when you go out of school. Because if you're at a system from four years of age, going through primary school, secondary school, college, university, by the time you get your degree, you're already in debt. You've already just learned from exactly. the textbooks. Is to op be open-minded, question what you say, question what I say, and question what the system says. Because it's important to understand your life can be amazing, but if you're programmed for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, it's hard to unprogram because if you're giving people tools and techniques, they think you're fucking crazy. And it's well, not. It's, it's also, I think you asked me about how I was at school, but it's, um, 
for me, you also teaching power dynamics, I think ultimately, and I think that's the part I struggle the most. You're telling you telling who matters most in society, what matters most in society. And I think that is, I would hope that is what would change over the coming years. That's what I struggled the most, is that you were constantly, you mentioned in the history, but you were constantly saying, those are the people that we put on a pedestal versus the ones that we don't put on a pedestal. And, and that is, I think, what my stomach was boiling already and is still boiling to this day on the fact that you were taught who we should value, who we should not, without questioning that. Um, I hope again that changes. Yeah, because people give their whole life to school and you've got, you'll have your goody two shoes and that's okay. But some people's whole lives are judged on a piece of paper of doing a two hour, three hour test. Yeah. It can it can control their whole life where they go, not feeling good enough. You maybe get a D, you feel un, unworthy, you feel not important. But some of the greatest minds on this planet couldn't even read or write, like myself. I um so I'm a double dropout student so like I could I mean I don't know I feel there's so many forms of intelligence I would always celebrate the different forms like so I feel it's again it's, it's kind of thinking of school as a form of intelligence until it changes and it develops further but you know there are people that I know who's done all the top universities and, and amazing research and I think you are so smart academically and there's others that I feel like emotionally and socially you are teaching me so much I just I think being in the creative sector something that I am so grateful for my job is that you meet people from so many different walks of life that so you value all types of intelligence and again it goes back to it, so far we've only been taught about a form of intelligence but I I am I'm past now feeling guilty about being a double drop hat. I think it's um it, it kind of suits me because I was I was challenging the way things were done. Um I think at the beginning it was in my sector that's quite traditional the art world people expect to have again the perfect degree and the perfect kind of setup. But I think now I just I I'm looking forward to seeing what type of intelligence someone may have. Someone may have an intelligence that's to do with the body, you know, like you could have all types of intelligences. And at this age, I just I enjoy venturing in different types of brains, uh, not just one. And I think again, this is showing to kids if you don't have that intelligence, that's completely okay. You can try and practice it a bit, but really focus on the things that actually you can bring forward. Do you think it's more difficult for kids now in school or easier because things answers are at the touch of a button but the attention span is coming down with the technology especially if you say there's ten thousand images a day yep. that people can see so the brain is getting constantly fed information compared to the 80s and 90s when you're probably more manipulated in the schooling system but now everything's a form of manipulation whether it's textbooks whether it's mobile phones do you think it's easier for kids now with answers at the touch of a, a button with laptops and iphones or do you think it's more difficult for them to then be more relaxed and or is it more chaos in their mind where they can't even be calm yeah so there's two answers to that question one is that you know ultimately 10 fascinations is too much for your brain like when you think about it it's just it's overwhelming. Like you cannot integrate that much content in your brain. So the different reactions you may experience is that you you would feel paralyzed or frozen, unable to act as, as experiencing that visual cognitive overload, or you will literally feel triggered emotionally. So you go from upset to angry because you're constantly triggered and stimulated, or you will go numb and you just go along with it. But it is not natural to have that 10,000 images. Um, that number is also about to increase where ultimately... Each arsehole in the West owns about 7.3 screens, which is due to double over the coming 10 years. When it comes to our streets, a country like the US has 370,000 billboards with 15,000 new ones added every single year. So you are just about to kind of see even more. So that's not, it's not possible for us to kind of cope with that. We're going to have to reduce the amount of imagery that we're exposed to. And behind the scenes for us, we're looking at policies to literally regulate, again, the amounts of commercial imagery you're constantly being targeted with. And um, the second question in terms of school for me is interesting is that I don't connect to my external objectives. I connect to process. And I think that answers your question, I think, on that front where ultimately it's not about having the right answer if you have the right answer but you haven't understood how you get the right answer as you know that that doesn't lead to anything it's about all the learn the learning and the growth that you have to experience as you get to that answer um and you know i know that you also play tennis and i know you soon joined me for ballet um but 
ultimately that's about process. It's not about having the perfect shot. It's about slowly but surely building up a process that you're just learning a lot from that process. And that process is that on that day you were not that good, but you still turned up and you still learned through this. And the next day you were fine, but that's a process. So I feel for me, it's irrelevant to get to the right answer. I'm not interested in people who get to the right answer. I'm interested to people who have really kind of understood how they got to that answer. And therefore I've learned tons of new skill sets in the way to get to that answer. That's how you get to have fun, first of all, in the learning process, but also to really intellectually develop as well. So it's, um, it's, um, I hope it, because now we have all the answers at the, at the touch of the button, I hope that actually removes the, the need for that right answer, that objective, because that's never been about the right answer. Mm -hmm. I know that's obviously what tests are about, but for me, that's not what it's about. Knowledge and education is not about having the right answer. It's about growing your brain and growing your skill sets and understanding the world better. Because mm -hmm. we have been the guinea pigs for technology. Yeah. We don't really know. I think we're starting to understand now the effects it's having on the brain with ADHD on the rise, autism on the rise, everything's labelled, nobody can relax, everybody, nobody can sit and read a paragraph in a book without having to do multiple things. And there is a struggle out there and the damage, that, what is the damage technology is doing to the mind, especially with so many images and the brain absorbs everything. I believe the brain yeah. absorbs the majority of everything you see. Yeah. And then it connects to a feeling, but what damage is technology doing to humans? Well, I think now? technology, the damage of technology is now quite widely covered in terms of, you know, there was this, that brilliant Netflix social dilemma that was covering it brilliantly. I think the part that we cover is on the damage of the content that you see on it, where, you know, all day long. So just to give you an idea, um, when it comes to AI imagery, advertising or gaming, uh, women are four times more likely to be depicted in revealing clothing than men, twice more as likely to be depicted nude. White characters are always de um, depicted smarter than characters of colors. You barely count 2% of characters with disabilities. There's 90% of the population globally with disabilities and is constantly over-sexualized and about the perfect lifestyle. And all of that content, it does, does a few things. Exposure to commercial imagery makes you feeling quite dissatisfied with your life. You're constantly thinking, I should want more, I should want this, right? So you're just growing that anxiety that your life is not good enough. But also you're in a life that is not representative to everyone. So anyone who is not represented within this also feels horrendous. So it's really looking at what does the, the visual narrative we get exposed to daily tells us about ourselves. So it goes back to history. The people that we put on the pedestal, are, they, are those people really represented what we want to see about us, what we want to see as value system? The visual narrative that we see daily, are those visual narrative that we truly feel makes us happy, inspires, represents our values? Bottom line is no, they don't, but we don't know how to get involved. Obviously, we cover this in the book too on how do you get involved to change up, but it is, it is trying to think, hold on, I am constantly being fed a visual narrative that is not mine. And also makes me feel shit, um, ultimately. So how do I challenge her? Do you think that's why a big part of suicides on the rise and depression because of what totally. people see online? I mean, it, it's advertising and commercial imagery is built on making you feel that your life is not enough because otherwise you won't consume, right? So if your life, if you were super happy, you didn't need it, then you would not consume extra. It's built in your, it, they, they were working with psychologists in the 1920s. That's how it all started. The uncle of Freud decided to import psychologists to work with large corporations. And they were looking at thinking, how do we create needs and desires um, that you don't have? You don't have any of those needs and desires, but we need to create it because that will, that will push us large corporations. Now we're getting to this 10 thousand of this constant narrative that actually you thought you were good, but realistically you could be a bit slimmer or you could be, you know, or you could just have that bigger house or you could just, and it's constantly fed in you. You cannot feel good out of that exposure, especially when we know that the visuals that we consume are stored in the most subconscious part of your brain, which is a part that shapes your desires, the amygdala. So you can't feel, you couldn't feel great. I mean, if I showed you all these images all day, you're not going to tell me, Marine, I feel fantastic. Plus if I add like really triggering images of geopolitical conflicts, which is the case. So right now you either get these images making you feel you're not enough, you should aspire to more, or something super emotionally triggering. Yeah, you can't feel good. Even as a very healthy human being, you're not going to be feeling great. See, I feel everybody that's online, everybody that has social platforms, 
have all got mental health issues, including myself. I look at people the way they act. I can judge a person by what they post on social media now. I can understand So how would you judge me? To a fucking T. We're all craving some sort of gratification. Yeah. We all want to feel important and we can talk all this bullshit, but I'm still on social media. It can make or break your day how, how much response you get to a video or comments or what you say. And it's hard because as much as we can talk about it, we're still caught up in the system. We are still involved and you can tell who's really struggling with social media listen I've no issues with men dancing and, and stuff like that I've got friends who do it and I love them to bits but we're really talking into a screen craving electronic lights whether it makes or breaks our day it's fucking psychotic behaviour because it doesn't really mean anything nobody remembers what you post a week ago a day ago but yet in our minds we feel okay I'll take this selfie we'll talk into our phone it ain't normal so for me, the way I'm looking at it, I don't think I'll be on social media. And my job is to promote yeah. my podcast and social media and all the bullshit that I do. But I just feel it's so damaging. I'm aware of it. And I, I look at people and I think, wow, we're so fucking far gone. We're devolving. I don't think human beings are going forward. You're talking about 1920s where they're setting up this yeah. system how we get people to crave, it's like an addiction. Yeah. I always say they're 100 years ahead, whoever controls this world, are, they're always ahead with technology and new ideas. The stuff that we're catching up with now was already planned 100 years ago, so time we catch up to it, there's new stuff on the horizon. So I just think for a better, healthier life, a happier life is a private life. But again, I'm, I'm caught up in it because I do crave it. I understand it, but it doesn't mean I can stop it. Same as sugar. Yes, it, it's interesting this two things I would like to say about this. One, there's a brilliant book called Collective Illusions that I think you really like. Um, and it discusses our deep need to belong to communities and how all of this is being fed. And it's actually quite interesting because it kind of gives a few examples that suddenly if you see that everyone else around you has loved this food, there's a part of the brain that makes you like the food more that actually initially you were like, I don't really like this food that much. It's like, because it's so deeply kind of built in us that we want to belong, we want to be like the other people, we want to be liked, right? So it's, and that's rooted as, as us. Obviously, that's being amplified with social media, but that's why it's a really interesting book to kind of look at. I think something for me that happened is that when I was pregnant with my second, I went through a cyberbullying crisis, which means that we basically, back in, Octo in August 2022, we let go of three consultants in France and they threatened us to start a hate campaign unless we were paying them a ridiculous ridiculous amount of money. Actually, tomorrow my TED on this topic is coming out. And it's it's the start the bullying campaign happens that you just wake up one morning, maybe you've had it, and I'm sorry if you did, but you you suddenly get loads of death threats and rape threats and miscarriage threats. Plus I was pregnant. I think as horrible as it was, and it was absolutely horrible, I was looking after the mental health of uh, my team as well, because they were also targeted. I feel this divided social media with me. Uh, there's now really, I feel very different to what I felt before, because in a sense, I continued to have a life while being very disliked for those few weeks. And then you go back to obviously being liked, but for a few weeks, you absolutely fucking hate it, right? And, and that was a good thing, long-term, obviously not in the short term. Long-term, it was a good thing for me to kind of really be able to push even further the kind of the needs for that platform to kind of rush with me versus the fact that it is a job with all its highs and lows, but also my identity, the the support network that I have doesn't change. My friends never left me, my team didn't leave me, artists and partners same. So you feel actually, ironically at that situation, I felt quite strong. I felt that realistically my life doesn't move an inch from this. You're just having to go through that horrible wind that you have to go through when this happens. So going back to this, I just, I feel quite different. And I also feel I look better after myself since it's happened. I think the, I now really know that milestones do nothing to my happiness whatsoever. I, I, I see that my happiness when it comes to my workplace is about impacts, about people, you know, connecting with the topic that we do. It's about a random person saying, I was walking past a public art project and I absolutely loved it, but I really divided the, the fact that, because as you know, like you have days where someone is like, you're the most amazing person. And then the next day you're like a piece of shit, right? So you cannot, 
I've I've removed my self worth from those platforms. My self worth is built with family and friendships and and everything that I do on a day to day basis that is actually quite separate. So I would not wish a cyberbullying crisis to anyone who listens to us, but I would say. I feel I am now more divided towards this and I'm able to put better perspective and I hope we learn to put a better perspective with it that actually our self-worth, so all of this is not attached to it. But that's because it's toughened you up. That's because it's made you stronger and thick skin. That's the thing of social media. It kills more people than anything because it used to be sticks and stones may break my bones but names will never hurt me. Names kill more people now and sticks and stones because it's so powerful and everybody's got a voice on social media nobody likes negative comments if you do you're kind of fucking deranged and you've just became <laughs> so immune to it no matter who we are no matter how no, because i'm a strong character very strong but i still think cheeky bastard like I, the, no, nobody's ever says anything negative to me in the street it's all love it's all support but social media sometimes makes you question your life question what you're doing and we shouldn't be in a society where it is absolute pussies talking shit behind their screen. We understand now that these people are broken. We understand now that these people wish they sort of had your life or they had the balls to do something with their life. They don't. But this is the way of the world, but it doesn't mean we accept it. And that's the thing about social media. I think you've just became thick skin, but a lot of people would push themselves over the edge because words are painful. No matter who you are, yeah, no matter no, how course. you can separate it. And I it. feel if I was a much younger girl, um, because it happened when I was 32, I feel if I was younger and less stable, I'm sure this would have thrown up in the after age. I'm not trying to say, you know, I, I feel immensely grateful that it came at a time in my life where I actually could take it and I could take the punch. What I would say to add a bit of positive is I'm in a sector where 95% of people have inherited wealth and it's incredibly privilege driven. And social media has enabled artists or people to build businesses, community and reputations from nothing. Um, before you used to have to know a gallerist to kind of put your art up. Like my artist, Derek Abertang, who is in Ghana, was literally able to like become a mega artist just through social media. It has given voices to people. And I would never kind of, you know, I feel like I could not have existed 10 years ago. Well, 10 years pre-year to building because the company is actually nine years ago. So 20 years ago, sorry, I forgot my age. Um, I could not have existed if it wasn't for social media because you, you're you able to build a business from the get-go. You're able to build audiences and communities that would support you. That's very powerful. When I was in the sector of gatekeepers, would you know, you have to pay thousands of pounds to have a PR company. You would not be able to have a voice whatsoever. And that has shifted the dynamics. Like ultimately, now there's a power dynamics that has changed thanks to that. So not to, of course, I don't want to downplay the mental health impact and the fact that absolutely with cyberbullying, if you're not in the right phase in your life, this could throw off your, the age. And I think there's plenty that needs to be done on that. But separately, I would like to say that from a very elitist sector, this has diversified ultimately who can get to have a say. And that, I think, is very powerful. Yeah. I've built my career through social media. I've built my career through social media and my clips and my guests and yeah. I get majority of my guests connect through social media. But it's fucking damaging. You've got to be honest with yourself. Would your life be happy without social media? From my own perspective, a million percent. Because you're not having to pretend we're all great pretenders thinking that life's great, this and that. But when you actually sit down with someone, no cameras, no nothing, you understand the person more because it's two separate characters. We're all actors. In my own opinion, I've interviewed enough people now to understand what the fuck is going on and nobody ever gives me a clear-cut answer because everybody talks a good game because we've pretended enough. This is the character we've created to get us through life. And social media is such a powerful tool. And there's so much amazing stuff on social media but when you actually switch off your phone look at life out there look at the sky look at the trees look at everything nature scotland's fucking amazing but we're so caught up on even at the boxing i'm at or the concerts that i'm at everybody nobody's enjoying the present because we all have yeah. our phones out even when you're in the park people are facetiming people are constantly on their phones nobody's in the present it's taking us totally away from our true source which i don't know what that is but i believe is trying to live to our highest potential is try to be as best as we can. But do you think mobile phones, technology, do you think it is so damaging towards us or am I way off key here? That's just the way I see it, but I just feel as if there is so many positives, a lot of people get inspiration from it, but I just feel as if more people struggle now more than ever. I think it's always 
the 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 rapidity, like the, the speed of the technology versus how we adapt to it. Ultimately, as human beings, we're not used to having to adapt to that level of change. And and I feel you said it that I think we were the generation of guinea pigs. What I'm hoping is that we're going to learn to really divide what being a digital native is versus what living your life in the physical realm means. How do you actually make them both run in parallel? Because it, I still, I mean, you can see that deep down I'm a positive person. Like I can't help but to think that I have connected through so many amazing people. You know, the person who connected us, Africa, is through amazing. social media. And the the lens of conversation I've had with that person, that woman, it has filled me with joy, has made me reflect on things and, and kind of looked at things differently. So I cannot just dismiss like a place that has given me so much access to knowledge and people <clears throat> and conversations that absolutely adore ultimately. So, but I feel it's learning to live. I think it goes back to, in fact, what I just written is the way you evolve in your visual world is le learning to live with it. I believe that it's ultimately once you're aware of how something works, it's how do you go and live with something? And I think sadly, that third generation of teenagers, especially the one that went through COVID, I think for me, I feel incredibly sorry that they were the most hit of that generation. I feel positive that our kids comes after, our kids are younger, and they are already, their parents, like us, is aware of all of this. I don't think we will reproduce the same thing. And then that time goes by, I mean, first of all, I don't think we will have fun anymore. We'll probably have like something that is on our brain somewhere. So I don't think it will be just a thing of holding it in the hands. It will be very different interactions. But I think the key thing is, again, how do we balance? How do we learn to live with tools? Tools are tools. I'm not I'm not intimidated by tools, but I'm intimidated, intimidated by people not reflecting about the power that they have on us. So it's about living with them. Mm. Um, but the reach is incredible. Again, I grew up in a tiny island where generally everyone thought the same thing about the same opinion. I was dying when it came to diversity of thinking. I could never, I could never encounter someone that thought any different. So I am like... I mean, you know, I live in central London because I adore people who feel so differently about everything every two seconds. Um, and that's the place where this kind of happens. Now, again, then the cons of that is you could also be in eco chambers. So you see, this is the thing is that the pros and the cons are always so side by side. But equally coming from a place where I had so little access to diversity of thinking or knowledge, like I am very happy now to be exposed to a lot more. Mm -hmm. See, when you're pregnant and you are consuming stuff on TV, mobile phones, can that then program or mold your baby from what it sees the world and how it thinks when it's born? I mean, I think we, so I don't have a TV personally. I don't know, obviously people at large, I don't know how they, they, they how often they will watch the TV screens. I mean, personally for me, I just only have a phone and that's like a tool that I use and then I put it down. But I feel pregnancy is really interesting. We don't understand the brains very well yet. Um, I am sure that every single feel, thing that you feel is ultimately passed on to the kid. When that cyberbullying crisis was happening for me, I was obsessed in making sure that anxiety was not staying in me. So I was reading the book, Body Keeps a Score, that very much teaches you on, if you want to avoid trauma, it's being surrounded by love, but it's also move, move as much as you can. Don't keep that anxiety in, in your body. Because I was just so conscious that ultimately... I didn't want that kid to be born with any form of anxiety because I will forever feel guilty about that. So I feel, I'm sure how you feel about life around you, how you feel emotionally, how you interact with content. If you wake up at 6 a.m. full of hormones and you see a really difficult image from a geopolitical conflict, I am sure this triggers you. I'm sure that trigger is being passed. Once again, it's not to kind of start walking around with guilt as you're pregnant, but it's to be aware that you're feeding everything to the kid and for me it's really interesting because I was quite like there's a, I was a different person with the first to the second um the first or some of my investors said that the company will go bust because I was pregnant there's very few women still who have raised funding and at the helm of of companies and and so I my first was a punch it was like I want to absolutely prove you wrong. And it's interesting because Atlas, my first, is a punch as a personality. Not saying I've shaped him, but it's interesting to see that he's always action first. He's very punchy and he will he will go and prove you wrong. That is like the first instinct that he has. My second, because I was going through a cyberbullying crisis, was so mental health focused and so sensitive focused that actually my second has developed into much more of that. So 
I, I don't, I only have two out of two in terms of anecdotes in that situation, but I can see that the way I felt towards a pregnancy has already influenced the way my kids tackle life. So of course, and I, again, unconditional love matters lows and the stability of the background and all of these things. And I, for me, like my, my mom had postpartum depression. My Sally, I come from a pretty broken background. So like it's, it's, I was really conscious again to not, to provide something that was total opposite um, as I was going through my pregnancies. And I know that once you are brought up in a broken background or your parents are in certain mental health, you cannot ever get rid of it. It's with you. Mm -hmm. So I just felt like I can't do that to my kids. I have to like shift it. So I, I'm sure it plays a part. I feel I wouldn't worry too much visually because I think it's more vibration and sound and wording first, but I would worry about how often you're triggered. If you're triggered emotionally by those visuals, then you know, change your visual environments or don't look at your phone at 6 a.m. with those kind of geopolitical conflict images. Just watch out your emotions because visuals are not just visuals, they're also how emotionally they make us feel. But watch out on how you're feeling during that period because yeah. of course the kid will feel it. Because obviously when people are pregnant, they become a little lazier, which is understandable. But they're watching Netflix, crime documentaries, murders. It can't be good for the mind because the brain struggles to separate what's real and what's fake. So people need to be careful what they're consuming, especially pregnant, because their emotions can be connected to something as a negative and it will pass on to the baby. I think I would just be, so first of all, as you can imagine, um, laziness was not really running through my pregnancies because mm -hmm. I was writing the book and running the company's first time. But I would um, be careful to label, because if a woman wants to chill and relax, yeah. I would want her to chill and relax. And her being chill and relax might make that kid feel chill and relax, which might be substantially better than someone running a company that is super anxious, you know? So this is why I was like so conscious of not passing on anxiety. I feel also women have so much pressure when it comes to society at large that I cannot be in the camp to, to add any further pressures on them because they're already being told you have to be the perfect mom, you have to look like X, you have to do this and you have to do that and you have to breastfeed in that way. Like it's, it's constant and it's much more those pressures that create anxiety than ultimately their behaviors. Like coping with the amount of pressures that young mothers feel is the problem in my head much more than how they should behave. I, I would, I was still clear of this on my end because I just, I, I really respect all types of ways to go about motherhood. I think we all try our best. I've had that conversation with my mom where my dad was not around when she was pregnant with me and she said, I just try my best. And I feel it was quite a recent conversation. And I just, I felt, you know, like I have so much love, empathy and respect for that answer. I think the answer is most women and I think the majority of them will try their best. Um, yeah. That is, and that's a lot already. Um, and after this, we are so unequal in, in regards to the circumstances that we have, in regards to whether the partner is supportive and around or not. If we have friends that support us, if we have all of that, that it, I wouldn't want to put it on the mother itself. But it is important for the father to be there because it takes a lot of pressure off the woman to get to her main source of being a, a great mother. But again, it all comes down to the programming conditioning from their parents, grandparents, to then see the world. Should we be getting taught about understanding pregnancy from schooling? And under, but again, the schooling system only teach what they want you to teach, but it's to understand the natural sources of trying to be in your true source, which is difficult. That's why with watching Netflix and crime while you're pregnant, I, would, I, I, I wouldn't agree with it because it is important what you're consuming. But again, people don't know, they're none the wiser because it's maybe what their mothers did, their mothers did. Some people drink alcohol with pregnant, some people smoke, some people eat junk food. Again, it's all they know, it's not necessarily right or wrong. But for me, looking at it, it is wrong if you're drinking and smoking because the way our baby grows inside the woman is, is unbelievable. The way the woman can nurture it, um, the stresses that goes on to a woman's body, how the energy changes, it doesn't come back to a normal state for up to two years. Like it is unbelievable, the pressures of try to do right in this world, especially with so much. Even some kids might not have the newest phone in school and they'll feel part of pressure. Same as where I grew up, it was who had the nicest trainers, were the most popular. And there's so much pressures on life, but it's try to understand what's right from you. I think that is it. Is that I think parents is heightened decision-making. Well, ultimately, you know, you would know that it's the same in business where I feel you constantly are pushed to make really difficult decisions every five minutes. Like on Saturday, we announced a very big artist for the agency and there was 
a lot of pressure around decision making, various things that kind of went on in the behind the scenes. And I think parenting is the same. Decision making means that ultimately there's not one answer that looks substantially better than the other. You're having to constantly think and readapt to how do I judge this? Like right now there's a petition online um, through a mother that sadly lost her son because did a challenge called the blackout and sadly passed away through this, which is a horrific story. And she's encouraging to sign a petition for parents to have access um, to the social media of their kids to just see what's going on, to see if actually they can basically protect what could happen as well and the interactions. There's loads of debates around that. Like it's interesting talking to my husband about it. He was like, that's problematic in my head to think of policing the child through their privacy. Equally, I'm like, well, that's a kid and they might just enter exchanges exchanges or content that actually is not good for them. So there's no decision when it comes to a parent that is, that is easy or that is that simple. Um, but I think that's what I go back to trying their best is informing ourselves, access to knowledge, again, acknowledging privileges. Um, I think there's, there's, it's so much easier to become if you have a support network, if you're unconditionally loved um, and then make calm decisions. It's so much easier. When I look at my parents, they were miserable. It's, 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 it's easier for them to ultimately um, have behaviors that are not the perfect decision making because they're not... They, they, they don't have the setup for it. I mean, I'm in a setup where I can walk away for like 30 minutes if my kids are just going completely ballistic and they just take back my spirits and then just go back again and, and have a conversation with my eldest, you know? So it's, it's again, acknowledging that we're not equal um, in regards to decision-making, but it is decision-making. When you said about the new phone of the trainers, Yes, you, then you, your kid might just belong to the community because he has a phone, but actually I don't think having a phone is that great for a little while for kids, right? So no decision is perfect. Um, and parents are faced with this on a day-to-day -day basis with huge consequences on literally what they, what they, who they love the most. Um, so it's a really, really hard thing to do. Yeah, it's constant stresses. Um, what school to go to? Are you going to be a good mother? Are you going to be a good family? Because a lot of people are single now with single mothers. Some yeah, people have to I live two jobs did. and there's people who don't breastfeed anymore and everything is, I wouldn't say backwards, but everybody's just doing what they can to get through what they can. I understand that, but it's to question it, which is important to question the natural things in life from breastfeeding. Kid babies think they're in the womb till nine months. They still think they're in the womb. That's why skin to skin is so important. But some mothers need to go out and work. Some kids are as young as a few months older in nurseries and our nannies and other people raising them. So like you say, it's everybody's different. Everybody's got different circumstances in life. And all we can do is the best, as long as you're not harming anyone. But everybody sees yeah. the world differently. Yeah, and also I feel it's, it's um, again, I feel lucky that I haven't reproduced what I was given, but I feel it's, you know, it's um, how uncomfortable we want to be with looking at ourselves ultimately. I feel like it's... Um, it's a tough job because you're facing yourself. Some of the flaws that now I see in my kids, like the eldest rushes things before he thinks that that's me. You know, like you have to face your flaw literally in your own kids. So it's it's a hardcore um, facing the mirror moment on a constant basis um, because they throw it back to you. They will throw back your behaviors, the, the very behaviors that you are trying to bury. So it's um it's um but i i love that i mean you can see that i adore having kids i would actually love to have more but it's um i adore that challenge um and and i i like the challenge of seeing my flow into my kids and having to ultimately having to have a chat about it um so it, i think it's quite healthy but it is uncomfortable you have to accept that if you want to do it well there's not a day that is comfortable. It's an uncomfortable place to be, but I, I guess I like the uncomfortable seat uh, more than the comfortable seat. So what did you do after school? So I so I left a double dropout, so let's just uh, go back. So I first studied Hippocanyankine, which is a system in France that is actually quite intellectually elitist. Um, and I was one of the few that didn't come from your privileged background to enter it. Um, and then I studied then philosophy, historiography, which is questioning the history and who is on the pedestal, um, literature, Latin, ancient Greek. I loved it. 
Um, the problem for me is that I was told I could only be a professor or a politician, and I didn't want to be a professor or a politician. I might want to be a professor when I'm 50, but I just didn't imagine it in my 20s. So I moved to the UK because I was told, do you remember Boris Johnson was saying the top brains should come to the UK? We are open to international people. Obviously, he's changed. But at the time, he was mayor of London. And he said, please all come to me, um, which I did. And I then enrolled into the University of Warwick History of Art. At the same time, because I was overtly keen, I started having work experience. Um, and I worked with my first boss, Andrew Lamberty. He did a TV show called Four Rooms, where you had four dealers judging the amount of money that those designs were worth. Andrew loved girls um, and loved parties. He didn't really like to run the stands of the galleries. Um, so at 19 years old, I was put on Berkeley Square, which is basically the most known fair called PAD, to run the stand on my own, selling things from 200K to 300K to just under half a million um, that I had never heard before. Also, it was design. So design is quite specific. Like art is hard enough, but design is like extra hard. And, you know, ultimately... I had, I did very well. So I sold quite a few of those um, design furniture by Jean Prouvé, like 200K plus. Um, I was fully on my own. You can imagine I was becoming an entertainment to loads of guys who were thinking, what on earth is that kid literally running that stand? And that's how I started to be invited to like Art World, um, like to visit their collections, so to kind of go to parties. And I was really curious. And you have to think of me with my strappy top, uh, my little shorts, um, never a party girl, like, but super keen to have knowledge. Like I was constantly researching on the internet to try to kind of comprehend what I was doing. I'm sure I was deeply entertaining to a lot of this crew. Um, and I, I realized I absolutely loved it. I just, I loved what those people were doing. I thought it was really interesting. I liked the arts, um, visually, like the places I was walking into, I was like, I just love all this work. So I just want to understand better how that works. And that's how I got spotted. Um, and that's why I dropped, dropped out by Steve Lazaridis, who discovered Banksy. And he's a really interesting character because he's the first consul estate guy to have built an empire into the art world. Discovered Banksy and JR and Connor Harrington and all the street artists. And again, it was, you kind of have to visualize it, but I was there with my bicycle and my trappy top into a boy scene that were, you know, street art scene. And you can imagine the contrast once again, but I loved it. I just, I love what street artists stood for, that they were not just hanging works into a gallery. They were shaping conversations on the streets. And that goes back to a lot of what we do today, where you're taking visual conversations and you put it right in the streets. If When Banksy makes a work, everyone talks about it. Everyone engages with it. And it kind of ripples to be multiple conversations. And I thought that's cool. I like that. I connect with the role of the arts being that. Um, two years on from running that gallery, so at that time, I'm 23 years old. I'm approached by a guy called Steph Sebag who um, built his advertising agency in LA. And he's like, do you want me to invest on you to build your own gallery in Los Angeles? So I moved from London to LA and that's where I kind of touched a bit of your world. I land in LA, still bicycle and strappy top, so completely not prepared for Los Angeles. And we opened the gallery with Demi Moore and a lot of celebrities and and I had never literally dreamed of LA. Like it was not even on my radar. Like it's just, it wasn't something that I ever thought I would aspire to or be, or just it wasn't, it wasn't on my radar whatsoever. But again, the fund that was really interesting. Um, the guy will build CA, which is one of the most powerful talent agency in the world, Michael Levitz, because again, I was the youngest ever Gary owner in the States, asked to meet me. I didn't know who Michael Levitz was. Um, this was one of the most frightening meetings in my life where he puts you in, on a table surrounded by this huge painting. So table is half burnt and was put together. It's all part of a psychological test. And then you go for hours of conversation with him. And he was a very, he shaped Hollywood, Michael Levitz. He shaped every single celebrity you can think of. Steven Spielberg, Tom Cruise, all those guys. I loved Michael. Um, he's still around today. And, and the way he started to speak about having built his talent agencies, backing talents, backing their visions, connecting them, with making amazing ideas and partnership happen, I was like, that's actually what I found interesting. Um, hanging pretty pictures on walls is nice, but realistically, shaping again conversations and backing your talent fully is what I would like to do. And that's how I had the idea of setting up the first talent agency in the art world, where the artists would not just be 
selling out works for the walls, but doing public art projects, so literally putting their works into the cities, brand partnerships, digital partnership, entertainment deals. So we did all the art of Apple TV for David Attenborough, like loads of cool stuff where the arts, again, are not just confined to a tiny group of people, but they are spreading into your everyday life. Um, so LA was really shaping uh, for me. I mean, it was it was a very bizarre time because you're broke, but you look very glamorous on every single picture. You go from billionaires to celebrities uh, to Uber drivers who are trying to be actors. It's a weird place. Um, and But I'm grateful that at 23, I got exposed to it because I would never have had half of the ideas I've had today if it wasn't for LA. And again, comprehend how much this content shapes your brain. I think LA was, I was like, whoa, all those people are shaping the desires I'm going to have, the products I'm going to be buying. I want my artists to have a say in that. I want to have, you know, I want them to have a stronger voice. Um, so I'm forever grateful to LA, but it was a shock to the system at the time. Who judges the price of art? Because you get someone who could paint the most amazing picture and it would sell for £10 to some of the stuff that's £100 million, £200 million now. How does it go? How does the price change? How, who, who controls that? So there's two answers to that question. The idealistic answer, which is that like any sector, you would want artists to be the most innovative. You want them to tell stories that are connecting, you know, like the entertainment sector, a talent is someone that connects with large audiences because I mentioned Banksy, but he connects ultimately with people and people are connecting with him and are relevant for their time. That's the idealistic answer. Um, the realistic answer, which is evolving, and again, we're a big part of changing that, is you have gatekeepers. And gatekeepers, as we all know, are pushing their friends forward above. And that is not to judge. This is what we all do. We connect people who are more similar to us. And then ultimately, through biases, we elevate them better, right? Um, but ultimately, if you're thinking that most of the sector is made out of people who are upper class, we've inherited wealth, then they're not going to represent at large how the population is feeling. So that's why for me it was really important to think of a business model that would change that and that would elevate voices that were not just representative of those few people. When you go through the museums right now, you don't get our story, you get the story of a few people. And that is, again, my relationship with how do we get more artists to tell our stories? How do we fill it with missing visual stories? Mm -hmm. Can you tell, because in the book you talk about when people look at a painting, yeah. you can see who they are because some people may look to see what the painting's about, some people will gravitate towards it, maybe get emotional. Where does that come from? Is that just like anything watching a, reading a book and people get different things from it to watching a TV programme, getting emotional? Is it just a craft that people gravitate towards like anything? So I think it's, there's a test that Firefox founder uh, put forward is he asked everyone, when you're thinking of the word Apple, what do you see? So maybe you can do it, then we can all do it together. But some people see an actual Apple that is like a 2D. Another one would see literally the, the full Apple, very visualized. You can almost taste it. And somebody else will see the word. That's ultimately how different we are. So 65% of us are visual thinkers. And then the rest will be a balance and the rest will be verb verbal thinkers purely. It's about 20% of verbal thinkers purely. So actually, the majority of us are visual thinkers, which is reassuring, but yet most people don't think they can have a say visually. Like, same with the arts. They're like, oh no, I don't, I don't know anything about it. But that's the majority of us. We process the world through images. It's, it's interesting because I am married to a deep verbal thinker. So before he looks at the image, um, and he's still driving me crazy to this day, he would literally read everything that's about this image. And I always be like, but just feel it, look at it, interact with it. But he can't, he has to first acknowledge the text. But that's the beauty ultimately of the world that we're in. My problem is that the world we're in as as put, and we talked about school earlier, has put the emphasis on verbal thinkers, on words, was actually the majority of us is actually completely capable to identify and to connect with that painting directly. But because we've been told that you have to say something deeply intelligent and it is a room where you can only say really complicated words about it, most people will just not feel that they can do it. So it's again changing that relationship with our visual environment away from the fact that you have to say really complicated words and look really intelligent to literally observing feeling, training your eyes to see more and more as you go, just standing in front of it. Um, 
And again, to being comfortable because it's something that might be new for a lot of people to do that. Um, ideally, not to just literally jump at your phone to take a picture of it, but just to sit with it for a few minutes will make me really happy. Because in the book, it says that people can't even imagine if you talk about the Apple stuff, so when something you mentioned the Apple automatically, I thought about a laptop, an Apple <laughs> iPhone, and uh, but it says also that people, when they try to visualize, they can't even see anything. Yeah, so he, the Firefox founder who hired that test realized that he had a very rare condition that made him completely unable to imagine in his mind, which is really interesting because. Like, again, that's a very rare thing because most people will be able to imagine something. But, and that's the positive I want someone when they read the book is to think that actually I'm in the majority and I can think in pictures. If you are in the very small minority like him that cannot see anything, that will be probably irrelevant to read my book. I think at that point, it'll probably become something very different. But I think that's a 2% chance. Uh, it's tiny um, to be in that such a minority at large. All of us, like when you think of your memories of your past holidays, you see them in pictures, maybe. Like most people would see things visually. You are much more visual than you think. You're actually completely capable to be learning visually. But we've never been taught this at school. You've never been taught visual education. You've never been taught visual literacy. So you feel this is not for you. Mm -hmm. um, but actually it is. It's a very, you can train. And I did it with my eldest is four. I did it in this class with four years old. They pick up. They understand where the eyes are traveling on the picture, what is making them want to do or not do or buy like you can articulate all those things like it's just, it's available to all of us is there a certain way you should be looking at it or is it just the way you see it well that's the thing where um i talk a lot in the book on how certain colors make you feel how certain structure makes you feel but for instance with kids especially with adverts i always go where do your eyes wander and they will usually be like my eye starts on this point on the on the advert and then travel to there and then bizarrely ends when you actually have to consume the product on the product itself. It is very, um, again, back to manipulation and trying to train ourselves against manipulation in the rise of deep fakes and AI imagery is trying to comprehend what you're looking at. That's the, it's training your eyes to what are your eyes doing and therefore connecting them with the feelings that it's generating in you or the thoughts it's generating in you. Because that's how you avoid manipulation at heart, is that you you comprehend that this is the action that's being pushed on you and that insecurity is not yours, it was pushed on you. And that's the difference between something that you've nurtured as an insecurity versus someone that's made you feel insecure. So slowly but surely putting distance with images and trying to analyze them. A lot of, a lot of artists and painters, they do struggle mentally I don't know if that's with the creative mind. You, you read up on these people are cutting off their ears and they kind of become lost in their craft. Do you see that as well, working with a lot of... I, it's, I think it's like comedians as well. I'm, I've got many comedian friends. They're all fucking nuts. I don't know if it's the creative process or what it is, but it's the same as the artists. When you read the books and the history of it, a lot of them were loners and crazy. Well, I feel... The truth is that it's a very risky thing to do. So as an entrepreneur, you know, we have 50 plus talents... If one of them fell, my company is still striving. So I have many options. I don't have a single leg in my basket. So I have many options for the company to succeed, right? You build a portfolio of risk. When it comes to artists, they are risking everything on themselves. That is all they're basing it on. First of all, that is, like comedians, for me, very brave. I'm an entrepreneur. I haven't done that. Like, it's the risk level is super high because this is everything you're basing it on. Second, you will go through super high levels of financial stress if you're not privileged. And when I say super high, as you know, super high. And we all know that financial stress, I mean, the times where I was broke or financially stressed were the times that was the most mentally unstable. It is it, it impacts how you feel very directly, like not knowing where you're going to sleep, not knowing if you can continue over a few days. It's stressful. It's usually stressful. So I would, I would caveat again in the circumstances that lots of those people are facing. Then we talk back on the negative comments and how you feel on social media. But realistically, if everything that you have is risk on your reputation and you go through this highs and lows of you're great and then five seconds later you're a piece of shit, it's tough for your mental health because you will basically go through massive highs and lows with very little ways to build a stable uh, self-worth. Um, I listened to James Corden gave the most inspiring speech um, at a dinner recently, it was 10 days ago. And you know, like he spoke about the difficulty, even at that level of handling the bashing of the media. Um, but a lot of people in Lightline who's built everything in their reputation and same with us artists, 
they go from the super highs and lows where they got a great project to really worrying about whether their career is going to survive to worrying about what someone has written about them and they have gambled everything on that so I don't, I, I'm sure there's level of mental health issues, but I also feel the circumstances are very stressful and I respect them for that reason. I just know that those people are taking huge risk and therefore mentally it's hard. Mm -hmm. So when you're in LA, you're rubbing shoulders with the elite, you're kind of doing your thing. Why were you searching for other things to do? Well, I, I, I basically felt that London had a stronger network for me because ultimately I was in LA only two years. I was in London for longer um, I also felt more at home in London than in LA. Um, and I wanted to build a company from scratch. Um, I really wanted to build the model up, make it profitable from the start and then scale it. Um, something that I didn't like with LA is that I was given investment, which obviously is amazing at 23 years old. But the business I was building, I did not comprehend the foundation of it. I hadn't built the foundation and that felt bizarre. I, it felt that it was, I didn't have solid foundations. So for my second business, I felt I want to build it on foundations that are solid, which means that if I do receive investment, which we did later on, then it's working. And I understand how it works and it's like a Lego block and I want to build my own Lego block. I was also 25 years old, I was very idealistic and I was quite punchy. I, um, I signed a whole letter uh, against all the changes we wanted to make in the sector at 25, and I wanted freedom of expression with it. Building it on my own meant that I could say whatever I wanted to say, um, and I was punchy from the get-go, um, and that felt quite liberating. I think it's a nice thing at 25 to be punchy. I'm glad that my 25 years old did that. I think my age today, I'm not sure I would have the balls that she had because you have nothing to lose, you know? Like, you have literally no relationship, no kids, nothing. You just go, here's everything I don't like. Here's everything I want to change. And then you go. Um, and it was quite an incredible feeling. I loved, I mean, I was deeply stressed. I had spots all over my face. I'm sure I was like a nightmare to be around, but I loved that period. And I just remember that person very fondly because um, I gambled a lot on that at that moment. How hard is it for a, a female to be an entrepreneur, especially in this world where it's kind of rough and ready? Is it more difficult? you think, for females to succeed as an entrepreneur? Well, I think, that, I mean, let's just look at numbers again. You know, I'm a love, in love with numbers and stats, but only 2% of businesses solely led by women have been able to raise funding as we speak. That's the latest numbers for the past year. And then you have 150% more chances to be attacked online or cyberbullied. So you have more chances to be attacked, less chances to get to the money ultimately. Um, you mix it with... On a day-to-day -day basis, a um, little bit of discrimination. And again, I am white and middle-class privileged, you know? Like, I am not. I do not come from a working-class background, and I'm still your white. I still look like what I should look like in the sector, even though that's bullshit. So I can't even imagine um, the layers of challenges that you have um, with people who have much more uh, discrimination at stake. But that's the reality. I mean, to give you a funny one recently... Um, we are, we just moved offices. Um, we had, um, all the loose blocked in my past office. It's a really nice office in Mylebone, um, between Bonsfri Station and Mylebone. Um, and I was accused that it was me with the nappies of my kids who had blocked the entire loose. Um, even though, first of all, you have kids who are nurse will be throwing the nappies into a loo. Um, that would be a very specific person. I don't think any of us do it. Um, but also like it was completely false and, but my landlord had absolutely no uh, girls in, in in his team. And straight away, I got that accusation. Um, so it's little things. I mean, now we can laugh about it because I know I haven't put an appy into those horrors that blocked the whole building. But it's um, I'm constantly faced with things like this. Um, you're constantly on the mind when you're younger. You know, we talked about celebrities and billionaires, but I had to make sure also I was never in a compromising situation at a young age. And I didn't have parents behind me, so which means... You're careful of where you're invited and how and not to cross the line um, uh, past dinners. And But how do you also not hurt the ego? I mean, you're just having to think a lot about other things than just purely running the business. Um, and of course, you go through pregnancy as well and all of the things that are extra. So I think, yes, there are still tremendous challenges. I would caveat that I am still in a privileged position for them. I'm in the West. I'm white and middle class privileged. But therefore, um, there's a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. So what how, what businesses have you got now? Because I know you were in uh, the power plant, the power station, and you were yeah. photos of 
amazing things. Like what what is it? All that stuff. So we I'm new, yeah, I'm not really into that. That's like if, if I had the Mona Lisa there or if I had a picture of two monkeys sitting in a tree, I would gravitate towards the two monkeys. It's like, okay, I've, I've and just, I will embrace that. Like, I don't really know the arts, if I'm honest. I mean, you had those famous in. NFTs that were monkey vapings yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. in 2020, so you know you're not far off. Um, we built the first talent agency in the art world. Um, talent agency is where you have in music, film and sport um, representing your top talents. But traditionally in the art world, you only had galleries. You didn't have talent agencies. So you're basically representing your talents, establishing their reputation, and then making sure that they're doing partnerships and uh, working with the top people. So um, what you saw is true. Like we do a lot of the public art in London, but also in global cities. We kicked off the World Cup uh, for the first time in 2022 in Qatar with amazing arts as well. You're integrating arts in all contexts, but you're building the reputation of your talents as you do so. Um, so yeah, so talent agency is what you have in the movie business. So that's that basically is just a... Yeah, it's nine years old. An agency of the arts. Yeah, and it was the fastest growing company in the UK last year on the Times. So we've done well, but it's not me. It's a um, team. I've got a, literally an incredible team. Uh, it's all done to your team with you to do these things. Is that a certain demographic who's into arts or is it kind of for everybody because for me I don't understand that I was never raised well that is it. what we're changing James yeah, that is it? the reason you have read this book that is the reason we're doing what we're doing because for me like the arts or visuals is unless you're blind it's your world so yes you should get involved and um, all the numbers are I give like the fact that most of the sculptures that you see on your streets are your men on pedestals leading society forward there's more sculptures and Paddington bears than they are of women there's literally so little diversity in terms of who represents us visually means it's for you to have a say. Like it's not just the arts people because if it's just the arts people, then you get manipulated and you get other people to tell your story and that is a problem. Mm -hmm. So definitely your problem. Right, go back to the book, the stuff that we're kind of trying to awaken people with. So billboards, where I was from, a place called Saracen Street, mm -hmm. it was all, it was all billboards, it was all garbage shops from like, news agents from selling alcohol to yeah. uh, bookmakers to Indians, Chinese chip shops. It was all, that like, people loved that food, but it wasn't really serving them, especially with the deprived areas. In this street alone, there was like four or five bookmakers, yeah. people gambling, chasing that dream, which I was caught up on because you don't have money. So you try and gamble to try and get those money to try and get and your freedom it yes you. and you'll go to the higher class areas and there'll not be any bookmakers there'll not be any casinos so i can understand where they target those areas but yep. how why do they for your own professional information that why do they target those areas and um, with the billboards and and certain things that people see yeah so it all goes back to not being aware of your rights and you ask should i care about the arts and that goes back to that question when people are not aware of their rights, this is how you get abuse. Now, abuse can be the billboards, but also quality of the air. Like, you know, in the US, um, black people have a way worse quality of air because they're always next to industrial um, areas, even when they earn more than a white person. It's the same when it comes to visual pollution. It's literally a visual pollution. You're, if you're not aware of your rights, because I live in a very privileged neighborhood now in London, believe me, if you're trying to put a billboard in my urban, like you will have all your lawyers and all your lobbyists that will go, no, we don't want that. That goes back with privilege and being aware of your rights. It goes back to people feeling, I can't have a say. But actually, you're electing, this is your public space. Um, your phone, you've downloaded the apps. You said, tick, 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 I want to give all my content to Mark Zuckerberg and you're screwed for that and I can't do much for this. But when it comes to your public space, like this is civic. This is the space that actually you elect your politician for. There's absolutely nothing that says anywhere that 99% of it should be commercial targeting. Like it should be parks and playgrounds and, you know, the arts, anything that actually inspires you. It doesn't say that they have to be fully commercial. But again, a lack of awareness of rights leads to ultimately people feeling well, I, I can't have a say and I can't challenge it. That always goes back to a lack of literacy. Um, it also goes back to the fact that the land is cheaper. And ultimately, that's why they build that up. And it's not just the UK, by the way, it's across the globe. Like the US has the same problem. And it also goes that, again, exposure to the arts is divided in this country specifically and across the globe again, where your kid here uh, in a working class background will see, like you said, 
four to, we'll have four to five billboards will be in, in that area. We'll be constantly exposed to junk food imagery and nonstop like gambling ads, alcoholic ads. I mean, gambling for me is very problematic because it's one of the few countries in Europe who allow gambling ads. Um, I don't think that should be allowed, but that's a whole different conversation. Um, but basically, that will be the exposure that that kid has as they go to school. Your kid in a privileged background first of all, gets exposed to the arts at school because there's more exposure to the arts in private school than state school, gets no billboard, gets architecture that makes him or her feel that they're super important because it's a big, imposing architecture. So those kids get to grow up in completely different thinking about how they matter visually and what they should aspire to. And that's, again, where you have the widening gaps. So I think for us behind the scenes, again, we want policies that would regulate the amount of those billboards and especially in poor neighborhood because I think that's deeply unfair that one doesn't have it and the other one has plenty. You said it as well. The second stage is what do we see on those billboards? Right now, Coca-Cola spends 4.2 billion advertising um, uh, advertising revenue per year. Who? Yeah. Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola? Yeah, they spend 4.2 billion a year and so which means my kids as they walk around London uh, have more chances to see a Coca-Cola ad than nature art. So I'm not saying, again, let's ban all this large corporation. I'm just saying, is it really necessary to see more Coca-Cola ads than nature or arts as I'm walking around a city? And I think that's, again, comes on to regulation because it's not just bad for your health. It's ultimately bad for your mental health. It's not good to seeing those ads at a constant rate. So I feel this is goes back to balance and it's not right right now to have this overload of it. Um, and again, I don't want to shoot down Coca-Cola, but I do think this is not right that they have. They can literally target you at every single corner of your street. That is too much. Of course, but this is business. is in a sad reality. Is, I understand that. But if I get money, I'm plastering my face all over the fucking world promoting my podcast. Do you know what I'm saying? So I can understand it from their perspective. They know exactly who they're hitting to then get their sales. It's all a money game. Well, so I do understand is, that. But but how, if I'm in a poor area, because like it was say it was McDonald's, it was cigarettes, it was alcohol, it was gambling on these billboards, how would that affect me if I didn't even notice these billboards? If I'm standing at a bus stop and there's a billboard on a bus stop of someone smoking, would that gravitate me Trust towards me. smoking or is that a bit far-fetched of having no, your own choice. There, so there's loads of studies that were done where people were exposed to imagery of junk food, a specific restaurant. They didn't know each other and they would literally meet at the junk food restaurant a few hours later. It's that bad in terms of the direct action. Smoking for me is, um, and again, with full due respect to anyone who smokes, I have a team of French and Europeans, so you can imagine my team smokes, so I do not want to kind of target the smoking, but I want to speak specifically of how smoking uh, use visuals to target people. So in the 1920s, smoking had a problem. Um, the smoking industry only had men smoking, not women. And that was half of the demographic. So they were like, crap, like we're missing 50% of who could be buying our product. So literally they bought him psychologists and they said, women want independence. They want to feel freer. So if we put the new suffragette movement and those women protesting for their independence with a cigarette, then we'll make them feel that a cigarette is equivalent to them feeling free and sexy and independent. So you started seeing it at on the front pages where every time a woman was protesting for the suffragette or the independence movement, they will have a cigarette. The celebrities were paid a fortune in movies and that was the, the, the tobacco sector was very good at it, where the Betty Davis was paid a fortune to look sexy what she smoked and you started having integrated results. You had tons of women who started smoking and obviously the tobacco sector tripled, like quadrupled their sales within just a couple of years. That's to give you the influence of ultimately visual placement, but also visuals per se. They never said... This is, we want women to smoke, or ultimately smoking is to do with women in independence. They just put it in your brain. And then women were just like, being independent and sexy is to smoke. And then here they are. They had a great demographic of new buyers. They'll gravitate towards it. See, I've rejected six figure sponsorship deals with alcohol and gambling brands. But I did fucking think about it. I did think about it because I'm all about trying to stay as natural as you can be. I don't drink, don't smoke, don't gamble. So if I'm in here promoting a casino, I promote an alcohol, we're just a sellout. Yeah, you and know? I think... So, but, it is, but you do think about it, money, 
money does talk in, in mad ways and it does make you question it and I did think about it I thought well fuck it it's only money but the lives that I would probably destroy by promoting that with people not even realising and I thought nah fuck that thankfully now I'm doing better but um, other bigger things have happened but you do question it money does talk it doesn't matter who you are where you are we all kind of do what we do because we want a bit of freedom and to have that freedom freedom's in the mind but we live in a day where also cash gives you freedom and it doesn't necessarily make you happy but if you're in a good place it'll make you even happier which is important but yeah I fucking questioned it and I didn't like the fact that I questioned it because it's a lot of money and I thought well fuck it and then you think nah I mean question is fine contradictions are we have contradictions you have contradictions I have contradictions there's mm -hmm. nothing we can do about it but I think in our positions of influence first of all we should definitely do the right thing because we have no excuse we are both privileged you know we have a bed and we have food on the table and we can do things so I feel for us there's no excuse to ultimately go against the grain um, I think for someone that ultimately is doing three jobs and struggling I would have much more Excuses or empathy towards them to think that, you know, it's harder to reject something. I think at our level, it's, it's a no excuse in my head. I'm quite impartial. Mm -hmm. I feel you, you, you've you seen firsthand the effects of those adverts on, on your demographic. Like, I think you can't, you can't support it. It's, it's, um, it, especially when we know that we actually pay for it. So again, back to the tobacco sector, like, if you think that someone was saying that if you want to actually calculate the amount of money it costs us at a society level, we should be paying 40 pounds per packet because your NHS is paying the price of your delightful tobacco sector with every single health issues that will be derived from it. Coca-Cola ads and all that crap of advertising that we get exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis, we're paying the mental health cost to it. I contribute to the taxes. Well, then again, like the system, there's a cost. Someone is always paying for it. Um, so I, I would prefer them to pay for that as large yeah. corporations than actually me uh, having the NHS was always completely run down, having to pay for it. So it's nothing is ever free, as you know, and it, that cost will always be picked up. Mm -hmm. So the decision is who do we, who is going to pay for it? And yeah. I would like them to pay more than the NHS. But this is life and for me i i can't be bought never but you do think about it especially starting off in your journey i've rejected tv work i've rejected radio work i've rejected six-figure sponsorship deals with alcohol brands gambling brands because i had a vision and you get fast track to get bigger names and bigger guests have your own studio and it is sexy but for me it comes at a cost because what happens for me in my own mind you get stripped back you get watered down think this way talk this way wear this say this don't say this and you lose yourself and if you lose yourself for what? For the sake of a few extra followers and being fast tracked to get bigger guests. But what I've done over the last six years is built relationships, built friendships, built relationships with brands who then sponsor me as well to, for me to then take things to a new level. I don't answer to anyone. I don't work for no one. I can say and fucking wear what I want when I want. And that's so important for me. But going through the journey, you do question it because you do want that sense of freedom with the extra bit of money or the extra bit of help. But it comes at a massive cost by selling out. And it's not necessarily that people are bad that they sell out, they get these deals and then they go and do their own thing. But for me, they lose themselves because I wanted to start out and say what I wanted and try and educate myself enough to help other people. And you talk about Coca-Cola brands, cigarettes, drugs, sex, it all damages the mind. It makes people weak. It makes them soft because it's constantly seeing the negative external things in life. And we, we talk about subliminal messages, how? Because we talk about McDonald's, the red and the yellow, which is something yeah. to do with the brain, which makes us gravitate towards yeah. it. Yeah. How is subliminal messages in stuff that we see in, in these programs? Because the, they talk about Walt Disney, a lot of the old programs and cartoons have got sex, 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 but they're, they're built in behind certain characters or certain things, but the mind is constantly picking it up. So is that a thing? How true is that? Like subliminal messages in movies, cartoons? Yeah, but I mean, again, going back to this amazing book, Collective Illusion, is that you you just want to belong. Like all of us want to be loved and liked and belong. And then the subliminal messages are here telling you, this is what you can be to be loved and liked. And as a kid, you know, I can even see it with, with my kids now, like all you want is that, right? So you're looking for little clues in your environment and you're mirroring your environment on where you're told ultimately will bring you happiness or will bring you to be liked. And then all those visual messages are clues. Kids actually can't articulate 
in words for quite a few years, as we know. But visually, they they absorb a lot more, and same with adults on that front. So it's 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 bound to happen that your celebrities, your celebrity culture, what you're seeing on your movies, is all going to inform who you think you should be. So that's why it's incredibly important that whoever is at that level understand the responsibilities that they have towards large audiences. I think for me, at 23 years old, you know, I came from the French. The French are snobbish about the entertainment culture. We think we look down at it and we think it's all about people who publish books. And then America completely set the record straight with me. They were like, no one gives a fuck about someone that has been read by two people, but they will be shaped by people who are part of the same culture. And that said the ritual straight for me to first stop being a snob, which is a good thing as a French person, but second, to realize that actually you have a huge responsibility if you're listened by people, if you're looked at people, to think what is the impact that ultimately I have, what is the social clues I send, what is the visual clues I send. And they are, you sit with your kids, everyone mirrors. You mirror before before you actually say the word. You could say, and that's always what I say with women too, is like, you could say, go women, be empowered. But if every single day you reinforce that your core assets is to be a sexy object, like that is a contradiction in terms. Like you're not going to think, well, actually I should be really empowered. You're going to think, well, being sexy is the most important thing for me, right? So it's it's the contradictions are there in our visual landscape. And that is why we feel pulled, we feel anxious by it, because we can't see sense subliminal messages. On the sexualization thing is something that, I mean, I had to go down the, the porn industry route in the book because actually the guy who set up Pornhub is a data analyst. So he's set the whole, so if you don't want to actually watch Pornhub, but you go on the data side, he exposes all the biases that we have and everything that we actually um, ask for, which is really interesting because everyone always answer really polite answers. But I think this is a part where you're not lying, ultimately, what you're Googling at that point. And I think something that I found really sad through my research is that if you think that even when we advertise a sponge or a car is quite sexualized, um, you will have a woman trying to sexualize it as a, as a purchase was actually um, one out of two people who are walking around the city is not having sex, had not had sex for like at least a couple of years. So you're in a society where you're overtly sexualizing things, where your average person actually is not having sex. And that also, imagine the anxiety, the feeling of like, I don't belong, I feel crap by it. Again, all those like subliminal cues, um, that goes back to making you feel really crap because there's a disparity between what you see and what you are and that constant reinforcement of the gap between your two. Because one in three men are virgins. That's why OnlyFans is so popular. Now we can slate these OnlyFans girls and porn stars. For me, I'm friends with everybody from all walks of life, but it wouldn't be in business if men weren't paying. Men want to feel part of something. We all crave human connection. Of course. And when you feel like a loner or a loser and you're stuck in your house, you're smoking cigarettes, you're watching porn, you're drinking alcohol, you're gambling, you're going to be lost. So these people then pay these women to then feel as if they're in a relationship, feel as if they're in a partnership, to feel wanted. That's why the sexual, it's the biggest industry in the world for me. That's why a lot of, majority of porn is free. It's one of the most searched things online, but it's so damaging towards the brain. The more porn you watch, the more depressed you will it's become. It's one tenth of the internet. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, it's so huge. it's massive. What What is the biggest searchers online? Well, I think that's what's really interesting. I, I like to look at the racist uh, elements. As you, so my company is a B Corp, and we've done a lot in that space to shift perception using the art of our artists, especially tackling racism. Um, and I think the reason I find it interesting is in countries where they are, for instance, Islam uh, the, against Muslims, the highest rate of research are having sex with a Muslim person. Like, it, it's so interesting where you have peak of racism and people are Googling the total opposite. And, and that shows the biases. So for instance, in France, it's because we, we sadly colonize more Muslim countries, you have higher rates of Google searches on Muslims and having sex with Muslims. And actually here you have a high rate of Jamaicans having sex with Jamaicans. It's really interesting on to, I know like Pornhub is, you, part, you might lose yourself in the data side. The data can't lie. You actually search for what you think you hate. Um, and what you might say openly that you actually dislike, um, which is, again, such a great reflection about um, racism and biases. 
So what does that mean then? You search for things that you hate? I think you are clearly, and you said with online hate too, you're clearly challenged and threatened by something that then you desire at the same time. I think hate is not never just pure hate. There's usually all sorts of things going around it, like desires, like I wish I could be that person. It's quite entangled. I mean, emotions are not just um, black and white. Um, so I think what it shows here is that Ultimately, the way you respond to things that you hate is actually deep down you also desire them, which yeah. is which next time you get a negative comment, you can think actually they deeply desire you. So yeah. it, could, it could be positive. But see, I understand that because I've got a lot of gay friends as well. And the, listen, they get a lot of shit. But for me, the people who are always trying to out them or hate on them, I think they're gays also. Yeah, Could well, that you be had a quite a few politicians coming out uh, who had actually gone against the gay movements and that were gay. Yeah. That's really interesting. But Pornhub data, guys, don't watch Pornhub porn videos. Go to the data because he sets all of it free to access. And and then that's not the pretty answers you want to know about people, but those are the real answers, which is where it gets really interesting. I'm surprised though Coca-Cola spends so much because their brand is everywhere anyway. If they didn't promote Coca-Cola, it would still be one of the biggest sellers on the planet anyway. Would you agree? No, I don't think so, actually. Do you not think so? I, I feel, I'm sure they will still be selling, but I feel clearly, you know, like if you go to, sadly, countries like South Africa, like you, you haven't have it in schools, you have it in like, as you're walking around to see the lions, you have a Coca-Cola ad. Like they have nailed the fact that their brands was literally everywhere. See, um, I liked Ronaldo when he was at the World Cup. I don't know if it was maybe two years ago. He had a bottle of Coca-Cola, but he moved it. Now, a lot of these other big brands and superstars are Pepsi, are paying them, Coca-Cola. Yeah. They're doing it for the money. Listen, that's that's what everybody does, what they do for. The majority of people are doing it for money. They don't care about the damage what it does well, to other people. they probably are blind to the Oblivious impact to of things. Yeah. I feel knowledge makes it hard to not care once you're too knowledgeable in that sense. I would like to feel that there's a lack of exposure to knowledge. Again, goes back to the majority of content you get exposed to. Um, but I mean, Coca-Cola, even... Kilimanjaro, when you climb it up, you see Coca-Cola ad. It's I love a joke. the way you say Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> well, clearly, clearly I would not be the best ambassador. <laughs> like, I, and they would not be hiring me. So that is good. I'm safe. Yeah. So what, who's the, what's the biggest brands who, who have the most advertisements, who pay for the most advertisements? I mean, uh, fast fashion will be quite high up there, as you can imagine. Um, Mixed with your EasyJet and Ryanair, mixed with your fast food, mixed with alcohol, mixed with gambling. Um, it's basically all things that you do upon impulse. Um, you know, you'll quickly book an EasyJet flight to go on a weekend away, or you'll quickly feel, I need, I need a new top, or I just crave this. It's basically, you were not feeling that great this morning. Then the ad, you saw that ad. And then that just fills that void for five seconds. And then you have that void again, right? This is this is the power of those images because we all know that after you buy that that top, you're not going to feel any better. But for that five second, you felt slightly better. So they get you um, on your commute to school, university or work or same with on socials. When you're feeling a bit, yeah, you're just not feeling great that morning. And then this is when you're going to go, uh, you see a happy face, um, the happy meal and then off you go. You just five seconds of happiness and then you feel empty again. See, whatever from you're saying just makes me want to go off grid. Just makes me want to go off grid and live my life. We well, do, do. But it's like a contradiction though. Because <laughs> I, I always find want out, to but do. The, I always want to be in the system and always, okay, be the biggest, be the best, work the hardest. But then on the other hand, I want to be in nature. I want to have more kids. I want to have I think you're not giving yourself dogs. credit. So the content you support, the voices you support, documentary that you've created is changing perception on very difficult topics. And for me, like you should stay on grid for that reason. Now, how do you regulate the rest of your time by not, you know, that is, you should definitely try and switch off as much as you can. But I feel um, the content that you're pushing forward ultimately for me is necessary. So I, there's, a, there's a degree of value in that content that we don't hear enough of. So um, do give yourself credit on this. On the on the other side, yes, I mean you can regulate the amount of like you can put an ad blocker, easy, yeah, ad blocker, and off you go. But but you're talking <laughs> about billboards, you're talking about it's everywhere. It's like you go to New York, it's just everything's billboards. 
Well, just I say silly things, but like, again, living in central London, I don't have to go through Oxford Street. I can take the back street. Um, there are little tricks, you know, that could make you avoid ultimately the, the daily environment you're going through. It might take you five minutes more walk or cycling or however you go, but it can start small. It start with that awareness that actually, again, it's less about you feeling guilty that I have all those insecurities and weird desires. There's more thinking, hold on. Can I root back all those insecurities and desires and everything that I've consumed on that day? Because then I want you to feel that actually that is not your fault. Um, there's a great deal of circumstances for you to be feeling that way. Um, and then slowly but surely, just avoid some of the streets that are the most targeted, which then would lead to politicians thinking, actually, the food for on the streets is not that good. So we're going to change the amount of billboard that we put on our streets. So that starts small. Um, politicians measure food falls. Retailers measure, measure food falls. If suddenly the food fall changes, they will want to do something differently. So you can just start with the food fall. It's mad though that people don't actually make a stand from what they sell in the supermarkets, the chemicals that they have, even Coca-Cola, what is it called, like 40, 50 grams of sugar? Yeah. Or some possibly more. Like they give our kids this in school. We used to have a tuck shop. It was all crisps and chocolate and fizzy juice. No wonder we were all fucking bonkers, man, because we had sugar overload. I was nuts as it was anyway, but then mix that in with a couple of bars of chocolate and a couple of fizzy things. I was fucking off the scale. A young kid could shouldn't be consuming that. Everybody should be making a stand, but nobody does because we're all caught up in our own little life. But a lot of people even listening to this will think, They'll not be manipulated by bulbs. Because it, does, it sounds inoffensive. Like, I'm always... The reason it took a while um, for this book to also be published is because people wanted me to publish an art book, something cute, you know, something very decorative. And I would say no, because it's not something cute and superficial on the side of society. It's something that shapes us. But we dismiss all those things. We think, oh, I can't, my life is not going to change with a mask bar or as I am literally like looking at this ad. But it's the little actions again, put side by side that makes a huge difference. And we've dismissed, I have been dismissed many times on doing a cute and superficial job because it looks cute and superficial. But when you know again, the impact that visuals have on you is not superficial, it shapes you. So it's again back to knowledge. All those things are actually really impactful, but they've been sold to you as completely superficial. It's fine. It's just Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. It's just a light thing. Because then it was adverts on the TV. We had news. We had newspapers yeah. where we got what influence. Now we have influencers on Instagram. You've got the Kardashians, which you read about yeah. in their book. Like, how much influence would they have if she was to stand with a crack pipe and say crack is the way forward? Because you're talking 60 years ago, Doctors were smoking cigarettes, yeah. saying it was good for your health. Yeah. So if Kim Kardashian was to stand with a crack pint and tell people it's good for you, how many people do you actually think would go and smoke crack? Well, I think, well, first of all, yes, doctors were selling cigarettes and they were also selling opioids. So this is not a great time, I think, on the doctor's side. Um, they were easily bought, especially in the U.S., um, I mean, I would dream of Kim Kardashian not saying crack, but actually taking a stand. To be fair to her, she's studied law recently and she's been changing a lot of the ways she's going about the content that she goes. So let's see. I, I'm always a positive person. I believe that you can go on the right route. Um, I think also she showed that you can be a female entrepreneur, that you can have. So it's it's complex. I don't like, you know, I, I can judge Coca-Cola with a large corporation with 4.2 billion. But when it comes to people, I like a bit more complexity because... She's enabled girls to feel that if they were not super slim, they could exist. Um, that female empowerment was something that actually you could be more than that. So I will give her credit. I would say that she also pushed people to consume fast fashion at a very fast rate, which I'm, I'm finding that really challenging. So I can't wait for her to make more of a stand um, is the answer. But I think anyone at that level of influence for sure has a great deal of influence, especially on teenagers. I would hope she doesn't do it with a crack. And I would... It's, and I'm sure she won't, but I, I think it's it's very problematic to kind of think of that influence. But yeah. she has, you think of body shapes, like people turn up to surgeries asking to have the same body shapes and nose. So on the one hand, it's liberating women to think they don't have to be slim. On the other hand, it's imposing yet again another beauty standard. So yes, the impact is massive. I mean, yeah. the surgery sector for women is like banking that they, they're just having the ridiculous growth um, built on insecurities again of how you should look like and how big your bum should be or not and and that's being sold to us on a day-to-day -day basis yeah. see it's hard for me to look at her and see positives if i'm honest 
And it's not that I'm judgy, but I can only, well, I am because I'm only judging her for the sex tapes. I'm only judging her for the things that she's done to promote the all the fucking operations and all these people looking at they're not good enough. My daughters want to get her eyebrows tinted and her nails done, and I understand that. But I don't want her having glues and her fingers and extensions. I've seen the damage it does to family members when they're getting the fake eyelashes and fucking tints and extensions. Because we should be teaching women, girls, even men, that we are good enough, we are beautiful. And listen, other people might not see her beauty, but that's okay because they don't see their, their own fucking beauty. So it's so difficult, especially living in such a fast-paced world to then detox from 10, 20, 30 years of watching the Kardashians or watching reality shows or watching it, okay, maybe I'll get this done. Or, there's so much pressure on people now. When then we're celebrating uh, Be Big and Proud and... But let's talk about the heart disease and the risk of, of course. overeating and, and, and promoting these messages as if it's okay to be fat. Like, But I think it always comes down to numbers for me when you look at, so let's just imagine a picture of Kim Kardashian. There's so much economics behind it. There's the brand she's wearing that's going to make tons of money. There's the surgery um, business that is like booming. Then there's every single part of the makeup sector that is booming too. Plus same with the hair sector. It's numbers. Um and I think that is where, again, visuals matters because it triggers so much economics. Um, the more we connect the consequences of towards the images that we look at, I think the better we're going to be changing it. Because for the minute we just look at Kim and it's like, it's a picture, we don't care. But it's, again, understanding what does that trigger in terms of numbers? Um, what does that trigger in terms of action on the ground? And like you said, like, what changes are they actually creates? And that the more we do that, then I think the more we will be able to take action. Do you think so? I think so. I mean, as you can see, like, I believe in knowledge is power. I feel, I do believe that everyone is smart, but they haven't had access to knowledge. Yeah. But look at the vaccine and stuff. And, and I always say, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a, a scientist. But when it's constantly put in your face, people are controlled by fear from a thing that was 99.9% .9 survival rate. And then you've got superstars promoting it for 10, 20 million pounds. And maybe they didn't know either. Maybe they're just thinking getting a quick fix. And then you had that doctor on TV who got like 25 grand and he said it was 100% safe and accurate. Nothing's 100% safe. But then people are getting paid to promote something. And that pisses me off. And I will fucking out them every day of the week because I know I haven't sold out. But I do think about it. And like I said, I'll be honest about it. You do think about promoting certain things. You think, ah, it won't affect anybody. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad to speaking to you to understand it would affect people. It because people people. then look up to you. And people then follow you. And if you're promoting it, because even in movies, you'll see them with Budweiser, drinking Jack Daniels, yeah, smoking. Some of these movies look amazing. I remember watching Scarface and getting full of fucking cocaine back in the day because I thought, that's amazing. That's who I want to be. Of course. But it all ends in misery. Well, I think, again, it's understanding that those are signals sent to our brains that would then conduct to actions. Right now, we think it's entertainment. We think it's fun. Um, of course, there's elements of it that's fun, but there's elements of it that really shape our behaviors. I think that's why, as a 23 years old, I was so shocked by LA. I just, I got exposed to the fact that, you know, Michael Levis through CA and all those top tier agencies, they shape brains. Um, it's not fun. Um, it, it's very much shaping the content you're going to see and who you want to become and all the things that you're going to be purchasing and wanting. Once you kind of acknowledge this, then you can still have fun watching it because I don't want nothing has to be serious at all times. So you can have fun too, but you you need to kind of think. Hold on, you know, like today for that podcast, I've put makeup on. I can trace it back to the fact that I can't still look at images of women who got a really lovely skin. So I'm conscious of this, right? So it's just acknowledging it. It doesn't mean that you're going to change everything. I'm not perfect. I still care about my appearance. Um, recently with the postpartum I still wanted to look great like because I'm constantly exposed to images of women snapping back right so but I am aware that that insecurity is not coming from me it's coming from the outside and I can moderate it ultimately that is what well, that is the ideal case scenario I would want us to get to is that it's not you being shit or feeling crap it's ultimately all that external pressure constantly feeling and it's fine as well because you know you can't fight all the battles at once like if it makes you feel better to put on makeup then just put on makeup you know but it's just but being aware of how this was shaped and it's a great industry there's so many brands on my face right now that are making tons of money out of this right so like it's it's obviously just a great economics so being aware yeah. of that but that's the thing it's the constant contradiction of <laughs> Because I've got nice watches now, I've got a nice car, I stay in a farmhouse, and I tell people it's not 
the way forward because no matter I could be sitting I could be sitting on the street next to a man and we can have the best conversation I could sit in a private plane and it could be a shit conversation no matter where I am I always create conversations always create connections and no, and that's where I feel as if I can strive a bit more because no matter if I'm sitting in a five star restaurant or a one star I always have fun I always enjoy the moment it doesn't really bother me and understand I've tasted the finer things in life now flying in private planes and driving nice cars it doesn't mean fuck all it's great to experience these things but sometimes I feel like a contradiction because I understand it's not everything but then on the other hand I would rather do that than not as well because it's great to experience these things and we, we are caught up in this life especially in social media if you're not fl flying private planes or wearing a Rolex then your life's shit that's not the case because I know people who's got lesser than me that are happier than me so it's how you see the world happiness is a mindset but like you say it's constant because as soon as you wake up you're on your phone and then you're going to work you're maybe listening to the radio or you're then you're going out you're maybe going to see a movie maybe you're going to a football match and you're looking at constant brands on the football shirts around the billboards you're supporting something and it's great like people but it's like they're all saying you feed them bread and water and they don't really ask the real questions because it's like the Coliseum, they're just feeding them and keeping them entertained. It's like the circus, bringing them back for more and they're not questioning life, they're not questioning everything. But as soon as you wake up till you go to sleep, everything's noise. So it's hard to then strip back everything that you've learned, all those learnt behaviours for so many years. It's, it's hard, but it is... So, first of all, yes, through correlations, you can't fight 10,000 images like this in two days. That is not possible mm -hmm. at a brain level. But there's loads of little actions that you can take. The images that you click on, like that will feed an algorithm that would offer you more and more images of that type of content. Um, same with regards to the streets that you take and how you go about your commute. Same with the brands that you consume from and ultimately what visual narrative that they endorse, what kind of people that they endorse. And then after this, in terms of contradictions, it's like, you know, I, I was having a conversation with one of my investors who is very well known in the investment space. Um, in his 50s and he was like I don't understand why people don't take more risk or are more uncomfortable but I was like you came from a place where you had a very stable background you know you went to the top university like being uncomfortable is possible because you have such a set foundation I am just getting to that stage for the past few years where I can challenge more and more like for instance um, when I just gave birth of my second I just gave a conference with him literally on me, which before, like, you wouldn't show maternity and also leading a business. And it was just, and that just changes constantly the image that ultimately women can have in this space. But it takes confidence. And I think this is a way for anyone listening who is not at that stage of confidence. Don't put extra pressure on you. Life is already pressurizing enough. Now, when you start to build that confidence, you start to have a better foundation and you start to have more stability, then see what you can change in terms of the perception. See what you can, like we have um, our artist Raven D. Clark. She's working class, 27 years old. She's behind the largest commission in the States um, as part of a big sculpture park that just launched in Alabama, addressing how do we depict slavery, but also it's like millions of pounds contract. Um, so she got a mortgage after that contract. She is not the image of a successful artist. Your successful artist is normally a Damien Hirst or Jeff Koons who have that kind of level of money and that level of impact. So she's changing again. What is the narrative of success? And she's showing that she's, pouring that money into impact for her but she's able again out of being 27 years old to kind of get to that so slowly but surely when you get to that level of confidence you can start adding your bits and bobs you can start you know make up I do it now um when I do press interviews or podcasts I do but the rest of the time I don't wear makeup at all you can start having little bits that you're like I'm fighting back but it's not possible to fight every five seconds of your life that's absolutely exhausting um but the more confidence you have, the more you can try and have the little fight back and the little action points. And as you implement them and as you start feeling better with them, then the better you get at them. So don't put yeah. too much pressure. Because I've seen Pamela Anderson goes makeup free. I love it. Yeah. I was about to say, as you said, as we've talked about makeup, I love her. I'm so pleased she did it. I hope I will get to that stage when she's there. Um, and, and, you know, this is exactly that where she's she's showing that this is okay to do that. And again, if you love putting on makeup, that is totally fine. I'm not having a say about this. I'm just saying it shows that she's opening the door to what else a woman could look like. Um, and I think all of us have to wonder 
what is it that I want to be? And how can I slowly open the door for that, that there's more visual stories on people like me, there's more visual expression of this. But it starts small. And I definitely am not here to put extra pressure on the life that I feel is already pressurizing. Do you think these big companies prey on our weaknesses? Of course. I mean, that's the whole point of it. Like it's, um, you know, I mentioned it, like it, it's ultimately you start your day, you don't feel that great. And then you have this beautiful piece of clothing that tells you, you will feel so sexy and so amazing if you were to wear me. Um, you know, like all we want is to feel loved and feel wonderful and all of that. And we've been told that is the best thing to be. So we lean in towards uh, that kind of narrative. It's It's a very... It's a very kind of human feeling. So it's again back to kind of tuning in to actually, I didn't need that piece of closing, but I just didn't feel that good this morning. And that's fine. I just have to let it pass. But the 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 companies knows how to leverage our insecurity. Do you think that's installed? Is it, do you think that's just human nature to feel not good enough? Or does that come with confidence and try to be raised different as you're a baby? Where does that come from? Is that natural Well, I think I would instinct? like to remind that before the 1920s, like the reason those large corporations gathered with psychologists is because people were not buying in our staff. They were just buying what they needed. Um, they didn't have that idea of, I must buy what I don't need, right? Mm -hmm. Which is very us now. We're buying things that we don't need uh, or we're consuming things that we don't need. So that means if it's only 100 years plus, we can revert because it's, it's not like the end of time. Like we are such a small percent of history at large. So you can revert back to thinking, actually, I don't need to consume all that. Uh, that is not, you mentioned it, that is not happiness. That is not, deep down if I close my eyes and I think what makes me really rooted and grounded and happy, that is not that. Um, so I think you can challenge back in the same way that this has happened. The past few years have shown and I'm very hopeful about the younger generation. You know, Black Lives Matters for me is a very hopeful timing because at the sculpture and public art level, they started to question whether we wanted those sculptures on pedestals, whether we wanted those guys to still stand on the pedestal who had ultimately had slaves. That's irrelevant of the Black Lives Matters, which is a whole different conversation. It shows that people are starting to question about, hold on, do I want that guy to represent me? I don't agree with the value system. I don't agree with the position that that person has taken. I don't think that's the most idealistic person that I should look up to. That shows that people are starting to be conscious about who represents them visually. And that I'm excited about that. Body positivity has been the same. Like there's been loads of movements in the past, like five to 10 years where people are starting to say, hold on, I want to see more representation. I want to see something different in my space. Like I would like to start my day and walking around my city with ultimately visual stories that I find truly inspiring, like things that I can look up to or amazing visual stories or people from all different kind of ages and backgrounds that would fill me much more with joy than having be constantly targeted. But I feel that awareness is actually coming through. Um, and we've seen that in recent movements that people are starting to say, visually i want that world to be mine um not aspire to something that cannot be but being stuck in the past or learning about the past or learning about corruption and wars look at presidents and prime ministers all the blood they have in their hands with wars for me all war is murder no matter who it is and that's i always say that if every but again it's programming i was from a kid playing with young so playing with soldiers and tanks and i thought i want to be in the army and this and that but when you actually put it down if everybody if every soldier was to bear arms there's no war get the men in suits to fight wars get the men who's pulling the strings and paying you because people i've had uh, listen i would never discredit the people who's fought in the military my grandparents fought and i've nothing but massive respect for them but they even says that they're doing a job they're getting pro they're getting programmed to then follow orders and whether they're going to tell to get killed people they're getting programmed to believe it's okay to hurt other human beings. This is kids. No matter what skin colour you are, what fucking age you are, what gender you are, we're all the same, we're all equal. We are actually all under the same umbrella, but again, it's all come down to this programming of, okay, that these certain people cause this destruction, so it gives us the right to go and kill them. And the, the this is, that scares me also how vulnerable the humans can be because we're kind of, as much as we like to think we're free thinkers, we're so far from free, it's fucking unbelievable. And the scary thing is, how manipulated we can be to follow orders and think the world's only one dimensional because of what we see instead of question everything question left question right up down question the middle question all aspects but we don't because i understand that people are only going through what they see and understanding and under i get it myself i can only say it now because i speak to enough people to gather enough information to go okay 
why are they doing that? And if you speak out against it, people think you're fucking crazy. Like people, the thing about social media now, people follow trends, whether it's Ukraine, Russia, Palestine, Israel, people are just jumping on the bandwagon and following trends. They're not really doing fuck all. They're just promoting something. They're putting a flag on their story as if, okay, they're changing the world. Ask the questions. Who's the ones that's funding, who's funding both sides of wars? Who's the one that's funding the people to promote whatever it is you're believing in? Question it, but... Again, it scares me. And we talk about detox, which is important. How do we fucking detox from so much programming? I think it's, it goes back to getting involved in our visual environment for me, where you said it earlier, I don't have anything to do with the arts. Should I get involved? Right now, there's loads of decisions on stories or sculptures that are going to be put on your streets that are going to tell history for the coming hundreds of years. And I bet you are not involved or you're not like knowing you can get involved. This is as simple as like our day-to-day -day basics thinking, hold on, how do I get involved? Um, and I think at that level, I'm always uh, sat at a committee of public art projects with two people turning up and the rest of people thinking that they can't turn up. And then all those decisions are made when they're literally going to impact your kids as a commute to school thinking, this is who is most important in society. So it's the involvement. You go back to like, when you compare the trends in terms of geopolitical conflicts, it's a difference between being a consumer to a citizen for me. We have become consumers and that's a dream of also the large corporations. Um, I'm sure you remember Georgia Well 1984, but the opposite to Georgia Well was Oxley. So you had two for a bit of context. Georgia Well is the idea, that's a book, 1984, that is all about controlling the mind through being a dictator, and di 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 uh, censor and dictatorship. Oxley is about the fact that the more you entertain people, the less they think. The two of them are quite similar. It's ultimately how you control the brain of people. We've gone towards Oxley, and some of the countries have gone towards George Orwell. Um, the Roman empires knew that. The more you throw games at people, the less they criticize your regime. So you have to, again, think, okay, in a world where I'm constantly targeted with entertainment and games and basically distractions, what are the core decisions that are being made that I'm not involved in? That is your civic duty to be involved in. And that is a duty, that's a responsibility, because this is otherwise all those decisions are removed from you and you don't get to have a say. Um, that is not an enjoyable story. I can't tell you this is enjoyable to have a civic duty, but it is um, an essential thing to do because this is how you suddenly start to reshaping the visual environment that we are. Also, ways you get to extreme where or this entertaining world or uh, advertising world controls the environment that you could be in. So the detox, yes, it starts by little actions on, you reduce the amount of image that you're exposed to and the book goes in lens and how you do that. But it also is acknowledging your civic duty that you have. You, have, you are a citizen. You're not just this passive consumers that is being entertained. And if you are just passively entertained, that is problematic because... There's a lot of people out there who are therefore making decisions for you. And that is, again, the problem that we are facing. So you, there's also responsibility that comes with sharing a civic space. But you're going against the grain, which is difficult because there's over 8 billion people on this planet who believe, who don't even think. They just, everything's subconscious, where they're, they're, they're programmed to think in the way they feel and they brush their teeth the same, listen to music the same, put their socks on the same. It's just constant program of the subconscious. The thing about the subconscious, you can change the way you think and feel. Joe Spencer is just next level on how to change the neural pathways. And again, it's it could be hocus pocus for people and scary for people because when you're programmed into something, the system, you, you don't see anything different. So when you speak out against that, people think you're fucking crazy. I don't know. I feel, again... It's always privileges for me. It's, it's a privileged conversation, the conversation we're having. Um, I grew up in an island where there was a very little exposure to commercial imagery because it's an island and it's by the sea. Um, I also got lucky to be going through a school system that enabled me to develop how I question things. Um, so I, I, I kind of caveat this on, I am not a product of just waking up and just being that uh, really intelligent questioning person. I have, I'm a product of my context. And... We talked about, obviously, the difference and disparities of who gets exposed to what, but also school. When it comes to education, like your state school is not introducing any of that critical thinking, is not introducing any of the arts apart if you're in Finland. Um, and I feel that obviously results in people not knowing they can exercise it. You can't just turn up and just exercise a new muscle you didn't even know that muscle existed i mean kind of thinking about dance when you dance you just suddenly have muscles in your body that you're just like 
I didn't even know that muscle existed. It's like this random thing that you just never activated in your entire life that you just suddenly need. But the brain is the same. Like if I don't know I can challenge something or exercise something, I can't just wake up with it. So I give people full credit for not having been taught that they can exercise, that exercise their rights or their brains or their muscles. Um, and again, yes, I go against the grain, but I'm excited to do much more to go against the grain because I still... I'm fully a believer that people are smart enough to do it once exposed that they can do it. Yeah, that's all we can do. And I repeat myself a lot on podcasts, but I try and repeat myself enough what people can then question that. So for anybody, the milkman that's out there, the postman, the nurse, or the truck driver, listening to this, you can change things to then see the world differently, to be happier. Everything to me is to do with the happiness Same. in life because... You can be happy anywhere. You can be happy driving that truck. You can be happy posting your letters. And I've, and I've, every inter billionaire I've interviewed, they're all miserable because they're craving a limitless dream. It's constant. They're never content. They're never appreciative. Maybe they are. If you are, maybe maybe they are. I'm judging them, but they're never happy. Now, how can you have all that money and be miserable? It tells you something. Well, I think that's interesting. Happiness, also thinking visually, we've been sold what happiness looks like. So happiness is like a wedding looking really happy or a birthday party with loads of balloons or a holiday beach with loads of blue water. So we have images that were fed onto what happiness is like. And actually this is called the economics of happiness. You can see my geeky side. I go deep in research every time. But again, this is interesting when we talk about happiness is a lot of the extreme ideas we have of happiness are the images we can't get bombarded with. Well, actually, if we think about it, that is not at all what we feel most happier. But we are again fueled nonstop that I should be happy when I stand on stage or I should be, I mean, I am, I find standing on stage incredibly stressful and I'm always a nervous wreck when I'm standing on stage, despite doing it now or quite regularly. Um, I should be happy on a wedding day and that should be the happiest of my life. You know, what happens if you're not that happy, happy on that moment precisely in time, but you're served with images. They introduced recently the baby showers. I mean, baby showers are everywhere on our Instagrams now. Like you, you're meant to kind of- the what? Baby showers, you're meant to like- Baby showers. Yes, you're yeah. meant, yeah, sorry, our two accents combined. Uh, that's good that you have the double translation as uh, people listen, but you, you're constantly served on- this is when you look really happy. That is when you are really happy, which is total bullshit on exactly what happiness is. So educating yourself visually starts with this. It starts with thinking, hold on, I've been served all those images of what happiness is like. What is happiness for me visually or happiness full stop? How do I therefore expose myself more to that kind of images? And that just starts like this because yeah. we chase and chase. I mean, there was a great study um, came, came, coming out of the US where they said pre-social media, People felt that the, the average salary to be happy was around fifty thousand dollars. Of course, there's been the inflation since, but now it's one hundred and fifty thousand dollars per year. The change is not just the inflation; is that people are just like, "Oh my god, I need to get all the stuff that I see everywhere all the time," and this is where actually I need an increase on salary. That has no link to our happiness. This is just not correlated. But again, it goes back to that overexposure to images. I'm like, I must see the baby shower. I must see the wedding. I must see all of this because that is where I'm going to feel happy. And ultimately, we are, we kind of, we want to feel happy. So we would do anything to feel happy. But the truth is that it's not in those images. Those images will only feed a further economical system. Yeah, that is see, not I happiness. question all that as well because. I chased fame, I chased money, I chased status because I thought that's where my happiness would be. And then when you start getting it, the car, the watches, you kind of get the little status. And I soon realised that ain't fucking it. So I have to unravel all that again yeah. to find out what is important. But again, it is difficult because we're brought into this life of go to school, go to college, meet your wife, have kids, get married. Who says that's the way to live? I know people in a camper van who drive along themselves that are fucking happy and they live on the basics of life, but yet they're in nature. They just fuel up their car. As long as they've got their bread, they're happy. Like, this is a sad reality of it. I question it all too much. And sometimes you can question it all too much without actually taking more risks now. And I've built everything through risk, but then you become more skeptical of everything you see, everything you watch, everything you read. And then I think, is that life? Like, if I had the big car, I remember driving down the motorway, I got a Range Rover driving down, 
and I was fucking miserable. I felt as if I was trying to force myself to be happy because it was as if this will fill up with the pieces. And then I soon realised I didn't give a fuck. The happiest I've ever been getting a car was my first ever car, which was a little Rover. And I was ecstatic. The first, when I was doing the podcast and I had, I think it was a thousand viewers or 10,000 viewers, I thought I'd made that. The, that feeling of what I'd seen made me so happy. But then you start hitting new milestones and goals. You don't really get that same feeling. But I think it all goes back to, for me, taking a step back and thinking again, what are the parts I can derive that makes me happy? So more than being in the land of questions on a constant basis, which will be exhausting. Like I know I have the answers for me where it's the person that walked by our public art project and just says, I was having a crap day and I just saw this project and I feel better. That is worse so much in comparison of a Forbes 30 under 30 or any milestones. I will put that as so much higher for my happiness. The second thing is I realize that I enjoy process. We talked about it earlier, but it's not about, a lot of overachievers actually get miserable once they got the thing, um, because I feel it's a process. I enjoy seeing that I'm developing new parts of my brain or my body or ways to learn as I am trying to get something. And that is the enjoyable part. It's not the objective. It is again, back to, I didn't think I could develop parts of myself and I'm learning about myself and I enjoy all that aspect. So it, it means that like I can still tune in to being in the world of achievement because I have to as someone that leads a business ultimately. But I know now that once a big milestone is being reached and we announce it, that I won't feel happy on that day because this is not where I put my happiness. I, I kind of, I tune in to the parts that I feel happy when I see... Um, People from all walks of life saying, this really helped me life-wise to read your book or to address things. I know that that, that can stay with me for quite a while. Um, mm -hmm. This has impact. It's ultimately that you care about other people, you connect deeply with other people, and then you can see that you've added value in that interaction at a human level. That stays with me for a long time. Process as well. Like um, I enjoy, like I said, like I enjoy seeing that my brain can do different things or questioning. And that's the part that I find enjoyable. But objectives, milestone, leaves me very cold. Um, not yeah. in a way that obviously they, they enable my company to go further. So I understand the necessity that they have at a business level, um, but they have no connection to my happiness. Mm -hmm. But it's the old fashioned saying, it's divide and conquer. It's so true and I always fucking repeat it because it's so important as soon as you're born, you give a name, you give a religion, you support this or do this. Everything's labels, everything's to divide because it's easy to control. Even religion, I've no disrespect to religion. I've never shoot on, shit on religion. I was raised a Catholic, but when you actually look into religion, it's no different from having an imaginary friend. When you're praying, it's a form of meditation. There's so many people who follow religions that do amazing in the world, but it also brings a lot of destruction. And I think a lot of people can use religion as a pass to then do bad shit that they do. So... For me, it's just question everything. Maybe I should follow a religion. Maybe I should get married. Maybe I should be drinking Coca-Cola or smoking. Maybe I should be doing all that shit. But for me, it's just a question everything. I, my mind and thought process will change every day, every hour, every minute, every year. I'll, I'll see things differently. There was a time in my life I thought cocaine and alcohol and smoking and all that stuff was cool. I believed that. I believed that the more coke I could take, I was the coolest person at the party. It's fucking deluded thinking. So things change. I see the world down. I don't want to shoot people down or preach, but you can have more. You can be more. You can think more, but just we're so caught up in a rat race, it's hard to think for yourself because we're just trying to get ends meet and just feed the family and put food on the table and pay your bills. It's constant. We only get... I'm blessed enough now to be doing well and have my freedom, but people only live paycheck to paycheck and they're working so hard that... They're barely surviving. There's people with two jobs that can fucking afford to put food on the table. And who says that, oh, because if you're the hardest worker in the world, gets the more success. It's not the case because your nurses and your, your road sweepers will be earning the most money because the hours they put in and the phenomenal work that some people do, they don't get the credit they deserve. And it's sad because a lot of people have got greatness in them. A lot of people have got so much talent, so much belief, but you're so dumbed down in this society and what you consume you don't think anymore. You're just caught up in that system of... Yeah, which is why I think for me, again, on putting less pressure for yourself, if you are caught up in that loop and you have actually no time to breathe, an ad blocker or just 
uh, the images that you click on will be the, might be the only action you can do right now, but that will be effective enough. If you have more time, this is where you take on your civic duty and see if you can get involved and have a say in the public art space and other spaces, right? It's, it's, um, it's gradually moving towards it because I don't want, again, someone to feel like, I am barely breathing and I'm surviving and she's adding another thing I should be worried about. But it's just slowly solicited actions that are free to do that you can start retaking that control. You know, the dinner we met, um, we we were discussing what makes you the happiest on a day-to-day -day basis. And it is agency, it's empowerment that ultimately drives you to be a much happier person. Just feeling that you have some level of control over a life and a world that feels so out of control. And I think that is again through those little actions that we bring through the book that you you have agency. And I believe that every human being deserves agency, deserves to ultimately feel that they can be empowered um, and not just imposed on. So agency can start small um, yeah. and then you gradually build towards a higher level of agency. But it's it's all what we look forward. We, we we want to be human beings, not just little robots kind of driven around. Where is the happiest place on the, on the, on the planet as our stats to say there's a certain place that's happier? For me, anywhere is like Finland, like you say, or Fiji, is a places that people are happier. Yeah, so Finland was elected as a for the seventh year running as the happiest country in the world, um, seven year in a row, and they have less exposure to commercial imagery, they have more exposure to the arts, and they have an education that is questioning again the environment that we're in. So. Um, I would be in Finland if it wasn't for having to learn Finnish, which is very hard um, as a language to learn. Um, but they are the happiest country in the world. I mean, the answer is blatant. But, you know, most of these, most of these that we've led for that book, the answers are very obvious. Like, you don't have to really look for a very complex answer. It's We actually deep down know what makes us happy. What makes you happy? So many things. Um, yeah, I can't answer a single thing. I think... We're both parents, so I will have to put my kids first. Um, it is, I think it is something, again, from coming from a place where family life wasn't happiness to see your kids blissfully happy in a happy situation. I'm sure you feel the same way, where you're like, I still have to pose and watch it and think, this is incredible because for them, the home is a happy place. That mm -hmm. is how they think of the home. Like, it's yeah. a place where... They're happy, where they have fun, where they like, it's, um, it's interesting because, because again, I was not happy at home. I used to love going to school and my eldest prefers a home than school. Again, I'm not encouraging it. I respect education, but I feel it's, it's, it's funny for me as a parent where school was the escape, um, from a place I didn't want to be in. Now my son is just like, but I'd like to be with you guys. Um, so it's the biggest tribute. Um, they keep me in check. After this, frankly, you know, I have a life that is, I, I'm very loved in the life that I have. Um, and I feel the, like I have interactions with people that whether it's conversations, whether it's exchanges where those those are deep conversations, they're fulfilling conversations, they, they're meaningful exchanges. Um, and, and again, I feel the empathy and the love. Um, and I feel it for my family too, like as complicated as they are, um, I still feel there's bits of love and there are different types of love. So I feel quite rich in the in the emotional interactions and love interactions that I have. Um, I'm incredibly privileged in the visual environment that I have. I have a beautiful home full of art. Um, I walk around the streets and there's nature and there's art. Like I just feel very lucky. Um, but yeah, as you can see, I, just, I don't, I have no complaints. I don't want to uh, paint, uh, like paint a, a pretty picture like all of us I have highs and lows this is impossible not to have them um I receive a high amount of stress into my workplace sometimes so of course I have highs and lows but I think I am grateful and I and I understand um the, the dynamic between feeling grateful and having those high pressures so I'm in a place where I feel um I, I recognize how that dynamic works um so overall I would say yeah I'm quite satisfied with life what do you think humans are? What do you think we are? Um, that's interesting because with the rise of artificial intelligence, um, I loved what a researcher recently said, where he said, we used to think we were the smartest, but actually we're going to be a bunch of idiots in comparison of AI intelligence. But we are feeling people, feeling beings. Um, and that that is something that I connect with because emotional intelligence is one of the intelligence that I actually value the highest. Um 
because it goes back to, again, all the conversation we had on visuals. It's not just about being the smartest in the room and analyzing them perfectly. It's about the emotions and the relationships that we have with our visual environment. Um, but I think as artificial intelligence is going to answer all the questions, and you said it, we can have everything at a click of a button, I think a human being is is a social intelligence, is an emotional intelligence, is again that feeling being. Um, and then we're going to have to get a lot better at that because I don't think we're very good at it so far. So um, hopefully that's where we step up. I wouldn't say it's a tricky time. Like life is a beautiful thing, but I question who we are, who created us, why are we here. Just doesn't make sense to me. Are we AI? Are we computers? Are we avatars? Just life. It just doesn't feel real sometimes. It feels as if because you can, can create your own life. For me, that's that's like a computer. Then that's like AI. That's you. You are the creator of whatever we're in. So now you've got metaverse. You're going down another hole. How many? How many levels have we came down to get to the true source? I, I genuinely don't know. So it is a beautiful mess sometimes, life. Yeah, it is a uh, bit. But I think that's, I was about to say, as you said, that it is colourful. It's colours, you know, like yeah. it's, because um, I think I'm in a life where what I had hoped or visualised, I get to live in a daily basis. That, mm -hmm. That's so bizarre as something. Like you, you're, in your early 20s, you hope you will kind of live that kind of life. And then 10 years later, you get to have it. This is a very bizarre feeling. And it's quite meta because it is a mix of digital and physical and, and you kind of designed it partially. But there's also the messiness of, again, like having sex, getting angry, like having conflicts with people, like it's messy. Um, and, and life is, as human beings, is incredibly messy, mixed with all the other joys that you add to that. But but I think that is the that is the human experience. It's that kind of mix and bunch. And I think I'm probably someone that um likes to enjoy every aspect of it um and enjoys the fact that there's all as a human being you have so many different facets. Um but it is completely messy. But I like the messiness. I, yeah. I like chaos ironically. I think chaos is quite beautiful. Um yeah. you can't not you there's no perfection in it. So for people watching it's maybe who doesn't understand the effects of social media and the programming of subliminal messaging and billboards, f how can they protect their kids more? Well, I think it's understanding that by the second you put cartoons in front of them or by the second you bring them up in a specific environment, even they commute to school, they will start shaping who they want to be. Like silly things, like depending on the cartoons they watch, they want to be different types of heroes. Heroes for them are literally who they aspire to become. Um, all the ads that are served on their YouTube channels, if you're not going for the premium side, and I'm not saying the premium side of YouTube, but ultimately your kids will get exposed to things that they should consume. Then on the way to school, they they, they will start nurturing desires um, and things that they ultimately want to consume. I had it with my eldest where he's currently obsessed with jewelry, obsessed with um, necklaces and rings. And and he put me in front of my own contradictions where he said, well, you have an engagement ring, so why can't I have jewelry? And I'm like, hey, as a man being like, but who cares about things? This is about experiences with people and it is all the things that you should live through. But he's like, but ma'am, I see adverts for jewelry all the time and you have that engagement ring so you're contradicting everything you're telling me it's realizing that we again they're mirroring us too so me having that ring tells him that has value and i'm still sitting in that contradiction for the past few weeks because he's very much drilling my own contradiction with it so i don't know what to do about it I might remove the ring um so i feel this shows that like they mirror all the everything that we do as actions and they mirror therefore everything that they see what they see is their parents their close friends their family their peers their school the advertising the cartoons understanding that they will mirror all of that and they will Become little people out of this is important. Now, again, it's okay to have contradictions, but it's, it's worth knowing that anything that you do will have a deep impact because they will mimic literally the action that you're yeah. doing. For anybody that's watching that's maybe struggling in life right now, what advice would you have for them? I think it's not to think this is your fault. Um, well, I, I do generally believe that society it's put us in a place to be so anxious. Um, the news, because again, out of the 10,000 images, the news to be more noticed because there's too much information are now going for images that are even more triggering than 10 years ago. Um, you, you're constantly served things that really impacts your mental health. So first, 
don't think is it all me is it is it my fault and like do i deserve that just think actually the society we're in you said it is fucked up in terms of the impact that it has on our mental health second again start implementing small little actions if you're on a spiral down on a sunday afternoon then maybe don't go to the content that is going to make you think 10 times worse sometimes you can do it and and we've all been there where you're just making life worse but ultimately Try and see if you can not do it on a specific day and celebrate every little victory when you are not going down that spiral. But if you're feeling crap watching a show or anything about people that looks absolutely perfect and and would only divide further the fight that you feel crap is not probably the right answer. Um, if you do it, it's fine. We have all done things when we don't feel good, but just try and have some elements of control because that will substantially help you. Now, of course, if it's a medical condition, don't listen to anything that I'm saying, go and see a doctor. But if it is that actually you feel anxious, which is the most of us in society, then implement small little actions. But I would always differentiate between a medical condition, which requires help at the medical level, versus all those feelings that we all share through highs and lows and anxiety that society push forward to us. Do you think we're all addicted to our phones? I think it's hard not to be addicted to it's the phone, but also the content that we have on the phones. It's Again, the phone is wearing a sense of belonging is telling us this is what all our peers are doing all the time and then if we want to be liked by them we just have to look at them all the time and then we can be liked by them it's the most rooted thing in us that we want to be i mean again look at kids like when my kid my eldest has a conflict at school this is the biggest deal in the world he was on integration in the group like i, I hear about it for like two hours it's an enormous deal the phones have just done that for us. They've told us this is like being at school at the playground and then we just want to belong to that group. It's a very natural thing. Understanding it again means it's not our fault, but we need to put distance with it. It's just like you say to your kid, look, clearly that kid was not great today, but it doesn't mean tomorrow you can't go back into the group. You have to do the same. You yeah. have to just talk to yourself constantly um, because this is fed into us to feel that way. How are you feeling today? I mean, it's been a really interesting conversation. You have challenged the hell out of my brain, especially with your Scottish accent. I've had to tune into the sound while tuning to the content. I feel so far I've heard and understood everything that you said. <laughs> and I'm sure that you're feeling the same way towards my French accent. So I think both of us, I feel mm. I've done very well out of our accents. Amazing. Where can people get your social medias and stuff? Where can people follow you or ask you yeah. questions? Well, so I am on all of them, LinkedIn, and uh, which is more professional side, and obviously Instagram. Um Otherwise, like all of our artists also have socials. And the good news is you don't even need to be on socials. You could be walking around the streets and then see some of our projects. So I think open your eyes will make me very happy. Mm -hmm. Just walk into spaces visually you haven't been into yeah. um, and question more. If you want to contact me, absolutely use the social media. But if you don't and you just start to question, I will be equally as happy. Mm -hmm. Last question. What's your plans for the future? Um, I mean, as you can see, because you said it in your, uh, yourself that we are going against the grain, but so we're looking um, at the TV adaptation of the book. I mean, um, I, I really want to change first the place of the art within our visual culture and second to empower more creatives to ultimately inspire us on a day to day basis and third to make us um, to have a better visual education. So, you know, I've always looked at as I have at least 40 years ahead of me of going against the grain, um, but it's been 15 years. So 40 years to go. Um, and, and there's plenty to learn in the process. Like I am so, I'm still don't know enough about what I'm doing. So I can't wait to learn more. That's what it's all about. Marine, <laughs> listen for coming on today and telling your story. I Thank thoroughly you. enjoyed you. I wish you nothing but the best for the future. For anybody watching as well, get the brook. And uh, a shout out to Africa for putting us on to the connection. So yeah, God bless. Take care. And I'll speak to you soon. Thank you so Thank much you for having me.